evening, everyone. Today is uh, Thursday, November 21st, 2013, at 6.30 p.m., and this is the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. My name is Judson Pierce, and I'm, the, I'm very proud to chair this thoughtful committee. Welcome. Before we get started tonight, uh, I must report the very sad news of the passing of Giuseppe Fulce, our webmaster Claudia Batoli's father. I'd also like to take an opportunity just now to acknowledge and request a moment of silence uh, for the tragedy that occurred in our community this week. May their memories be a blessing and may we please have a moment of silence. Thank you. Friends, tomorrow marks uh, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. JFK was a leader and a risk taker. Indeed, even up until his final hours, President Kennedy, on his trip to Dallas in November of 1963, intended to condemn as nonsense the notion that peace is a sign of weakness. His was a viewpoint not entirely popular at that time. And last week, I remarked on the importance of the Gettysburg Address 150 years ago. Examples of leadership and risk-taking are present throughout that legendary speech. President Lincoln, too, was the victim of an assassin's bullet, and he, like President Kennedy, challenged the status quo and encouraged all of us to work to our nobler potentials. In researching the topic of what happened in our community near and around Boston on November 22, 1963, I came across an article from Time Magazine last week written by James Irv Inburn. On Friday, November 22, 1963, the Boston Symphony Orchestra held a concert. Its music director had just moments before the concert learned what had happened. He told the audience what had happened. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a press report over the wireless, and we hope it is unconfirmed, but we have, no, we have to doubt it, that the President of the United States has been the victim of an assassination. We will play the funeral march from Beethoven's Third Symphony. Now, WGBH recorded this concert, so there exists an actual audio recording. And I listened to it intently. <clears throat> Gasps are audible from the audience once that tragic news is delivered. What I found very interesting in that article was that Mr. Inburn talked about the healing and community strengthening power of music. He said there are times when music can seem a solitary experience. That goes for the listener, and it also goes for the performers. In a cacophonous age, he writes, the choice of music can define and anchor the individual, but there are times of collective crisis or celebration when music can remind us what a society is. The BSO music director was quoted as saying about that fateful day, in that period of time when we were all there listening to Beethoven in that concert hall, we all had to respond to this terrible tragedy for ourselves. And the music <coughs> sort of soothed us, reached out to each and every individual and helped us to process what had happened. So finally, friends, in our cacophonous and at times terrifying moment in history, I hope we can remember other times of great conflict in our society and the methods we employ to restore our sense of humanity. On this week where our community endured a tragedy so frightful and unnerving, and on this night where we hear from the leaders of our elementary schools, on their priorities for our children, let us remember that music is among those great healing powers that we must instill in all our children. And let them understand it's to comfort them, as well as broaden their understanding of the world in which they live. You guys have eight more speeches from me until April. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. <clears throat> um, moving on, let's, uh, we have a special, we have a very, very special treat tonight. We have some students from, our, from uh, three of our elementary schools, I believe, who are here to present on some uh, projects of incredible generosity and compassion. And uh, I'm really excited to hear and learn more about it. Um, so I'd like to, at this time, introduce uh, Principal Mark McEnany from the Bishop Elementary School, um, Dr. Eileen Woods from the Down, and uh, Ms. Gorman, a fifth grade teacher at the Brackett Elementary School, who will introduce our special guests. And it's, uh, 
Our students might want to come up too. Yeah, thanks. You want to come sit in the middle here, right in front of the microphone? Is this yours? Good. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce to you Katie Boyle, who is a fourth grader at the Dallin Elementary School, and she's here to share a club that she started this year at Dallin. Does this work? Yeah. Hi, my name is Katie Boyle. I'm in fourth grade at the Dallin Elementary School. I'd like to tell you about a new community service club at Dallin called Kids for Change. Kids for Change is a way for Dallin students to get involved with service projects. Together with my mom, my brother, and some family friends, Oscar and B. Carden, we can come we come up with an I with ideas of planning each month a new community service activity. Um, kids at Dallin can help with it. This month we are organizing a Thanksgiving food drive. Students um, students drop off food donations and gift cards, um, so needy families in Arlington will have a nice Thanksgiving meal. Next month, we will be helping the town of Arlington with their holiday help program. So many kids at Dallin are very lucky. Um, they get many toys at Christmas and Hanukkah, but there, there, but there are many kids who are not as lucky. It is important that we try our hardest to help kids, as many kids as we can, especially those whose families are going through tough times. The Dallin um, students of Kids for Change is hoping to have a monthly calendar on the school website that will list all of our projects. We already have had had many Dallin students and parents and staff tell us that they want to help. Um, we can, we hope, our, we, we are hoping our Kids for Change Club will go grow to other schools too. Um, we are pretty excited about our new club. Thanks for taking the time to hear about. Do you have any questions? <coughs> um, thank you um, for all of us for telling us about this. Um, I'm sure the people that are watching this right now would love to know, are other people invited to join the Dallin School in the food fundraiser and can they, where they can drop the food if your club would like additional donations? Um, I think we would like it, but um, we're donating all of this stuff tomorrow at 2.20, so, um, yeah, we would like it, but, um. So if somebody wanted to, they could drop it at maybe the main office for the school before? Yeah. And just let them know it's, that's Kids for Change? Mm hmm Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. This is Jackson Dre, and he's from Bishop Elementary School. He's a fifth grader. And over the years, Jackson and his family have taken the initiative uh, to uh, work with UNICEF, and uh, he is going to talk about his efforts. Hi, my name is Jackson. I'm a fifth grader at Bishop. My family and I have been supporting UNICEF and giving money to poor families for a long time. For the past eight years, we've passed out little orange boxes to the student at Bishop to collect money for UNICEF while trick-or-treating on Halloween. This year, my mom didn't have time to do it. I decided that it was still important to help other kids and persuaded my mom to keep doing it. I promised her that I would do most of the work. This year, Bishop raised $526.90. Some of the things this money may be used for is to provide protein biscuits for hungry kids, soccer balls for kids in refugee camps to play with, vaccines, bicycles to deliver medicines to small towns, and pumps to provide clean water to a school or village. Will you be doing all the work from now on? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> Good answer. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Jackson. Okay, you guys scoot in. Scoot over. One second. Push your chairs up. Here, sit here, honey. 
Cuckoo got one hold too. I'm too, I'm too. Um, this was a little unexpected that I was going to introduce these gentlemen, but um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we represent the Brackett School. Um, with me tonight is Varun, Nico, and Jackson, and they're going to tell you a little something about we do, what we do at the Brackett for our community. The Brackett community believes in helping others. The children, parents, and staff are always looking for ideas to help. As a matter of fact, if you were to walk into our lobby today, you would be presented with three drives. The Philippine UNICEF Drive, the Arlington Food Pantry Drive, and Anton's Winter Coat Drive. A few children have asked Mrs. Z if our school can start collecting change for the poor people of the Philippines. So a rather large bucket has been put down in the lobby. The money collected will go to UNICEF. Each year, the bracket has done four to five food drives for the Arlington Food Pantry. Although the fifth grade organizes the drive, it is a whole school event. Last year, we collected so much food, Mr. Colleen and Mr. McDonald had to take three trips to get the food to the pantry, and that was just one week's worth of collecting. We are hoping to double our efforts this year. Our first drive is already underway. It will run from November 18th to the 25th. The food is being collected in the lobby of the Brackett School if anyone wishes to contribute. We are also sponsoring 12 families for our Arlington's Holiday Helpers program. Each grade, will, each grade level will grant the wishes of two families. Um, Mrs. Johnson's husband has been deployed to Iraq. She told us that many of the men and women fighting over there are not getting letters. So we decided as a school to write to the men and women, uh, sorry, women in Mr. Mr. Johnson's deployment. Mr. Johnson is going to hand deliver these letters to the soldiers who are not getting mail. He said it will make him feel like Santa Claus. We will be sending out a total of 485 letters. We are hoping they'll reach the troops sometime before Christmas. I, I, I thought about a project I'd heard recently of uh, children actually donating their Halloween candy to the soldiers overseas. So I'm sure letters are, uh, are just as welcome. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's Thank great. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I'm really, really happy you, you could come tonight and tell us a little bit about this. I mean, we're having a Thanksgiving uh, holiday in this country next week. and. And a large part of that holiday is exactly the kind of exa examples you're leading right now in your schools. So thank you and thank, thank the principals here tonight. Thank you for helping us. We are, we are very proud of all of our students. Um, and I just want everyone to understand that uh, we that these types of projects are going on in all of our schools. It's just that we only had five or ten minutes this evening. And so we'll have other students come back. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that that is one of the things we're most proud about is the leadership and sense of generosity and compassion that our students are demonstrating by being leaders in, in these efforts. So thank you to all our students, and certainly thank you to the parents for the good example and their teachers. Moving on now, 6.45, we have public participation. Kathleen Kaufman. <coughs> uh, my name is Kathleen Coughlin. This is my husband, Mike Vardabedian. Hi. We wrote a letter to the Arlington School Committee that I'd like to um, read the content of now. To the Arlington School Committee. Our daughter is a kindergartner at the Stratton School. We'd like, we would like to call to your attention that the Magic Treehouse book series is being used as a basis for curriculum themes in the kindergarten classroom. The Magic Treehouse books are intended for children ages eight to 12 years old and in grades three through seven. The book themes so far have been dinosaurs, including armors, so, or, excuse me, armor, swords, shields, castles, dragons, and currently a book about mummies, including a ghost queen. 
The next book is about pirates. Our daughter just turned five years old in August. She is frightened of dinosaurs, knights, weapons, dragons, mummies, ghosts, and pirates. The reading level of the books, as well, of the su as well as the subject matter, is not age or grade appropriate. Upcoming themes may include ninjas, a ghost town, a dragon king, Vikings, the Titanic, earthquakes, and a haunted castle. These book themes inherently include elements of violence, danger, and frightening characters. They are chapter books intended to be read by older children. These inappropriate books are read to the children and they complete activities such as drawing and coloring pictures, making props, and dramatic play around these themes. Our daughter has come home with many papers and projects about dinosaurs, knights, and now mummies. Our understanding is that the kindergarten teachers are being required to use these books and activities for kindergarten instruction as part of the Tools of the Mind program that has been adopted by the Arlington Public Schools. We request your support in ensuring that teachers are able to use age-appropriate stories, appropriate curriculum subject matter, and materials in the kindergarten classroom. This is currently not the case. Please advise us as to how we as parents, we can move forward in addressing this problem as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention to this matter. I had attached on the back some samples of the um, Magic Treehouse book titles and just some blurbs that I got about them from Amazon. Um, the dinosaur book is called Dinosaurs Before Dark. And the blurb that I have about it is the mysterious treehouse whisks them to the prehistoric past. Now they have to figure out how to get home. Can they do it before dark or will they become a dinosaur's dinner? The night at dawn. Jack and Annie travel back in time to medieval England for an adventure in inside a storybook castle from feasting hall to dreadful dungeon. Mummies in the morning. For this adventure, they select a story on ancient Egypt and travel back to the pyramid of Queen Hutepi, who needs to find her copy of the Book of the Dead for a journey through the underworld. Will Jack and Annie be able to solve the puzzle or will they end up as mummies themselves? I'll just say one more. Jack, the Pirates Past Noon, which I, is the next book, I believe. Jack and Annie are in for a high seas adventure when the magic treehouse whisks them back to the days of deserted islands, secret maps, and ruthless pirates. Will they discover a buried treasure, or will they be forced to walk the plank? And there's some other examples of books that are later in the series. We're hoping for some support and some ideas of um, how we could move forward. And uh, we wanted to draw this to the attention of the school committee. And that our, our daughter uh, often comes home at night spooked. You know, she uh, sometimes will uh, not even want to go in her room. And I know that's what sometimes five-year-old kids do. I get that. But it seems to be a little more as of late. And every once in a while at dinner time, she'll bring up talking about mummies and stuff that they talked about at school. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. I think that's it for public participation. Okay. Um, we'll be having a discussion in about an hour on the new kindergarten curriculum tools of the mind that will be coming up at 5 to 8. Uh, but right now, on our agenda, we are very fortunate uh, to have this sort of yearly um, presentation by our elementary school principals. I'd like to invite them up uh, to, the, to the desk if they so choose. Oh, Mr. McEnany is leading the charge. <laughs> oh, excellent. I feel good. Perhaps uh, you could all introduce yourselves, um, the community, and us in this room. Uh, before I get started, I was Negligent. I did not point out Siobhan Foley from the AEA, who's joined us tonight. Welcome, Siobhan. Um, why don't we start with uh, from that side. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Kristen DeFrancisco, and I am the principal at Hardy School. Good evening, Mark McEnany, principal at Bishop Elementary. Evening, Michael Hanna, principal at Stratton School. Karen Harvey, principal of the Pierce Elementary School. Sherry Donovan, the principal of the Thompson School. 
on the agenda is essentially the discussion of your priorities that you come up with together individually on um, crafting an FY15 budget. Um, I know that we started the process um, with our budget subcommittee and we've talked about it here at the table and we've talked about it with town leaders recently as well. So I'm sure my, member, my fellow members are very curious about what you all <laughs> well, uh, thank you for having us uh, tonight to discuss uh, the budget considerations for next year. Uh, I want to start by just acknowledging uh, Dr. Thielman. Uh, congratulations on your school committee uh, achievement award that you were just uh, honored with at the uh, school committee superintendent's conference down in uh, Hyannis a couple of weeks ago. Thanks very congratulations. much. Congratulations. So we begin first by thanking you, the school committee, uh, the superintendent, and the assistant superintendent for um, supporting the elementary schools as um, in for our um, I'm sorry uh, for staffing this year to support lower class sizes and supporting the integration of technology and professional development as, as we have started with the um, full implementation of the common core state standards so tonight I will frame for you our recommendations for the elementary schools as they relate to the importance of staffing to maintain low class size, the need for additional trained teaching assistants, the consideration for additional behavioral specialist personnel, and the need to develop a job description specific to the library teaching position, along with changing this title and a discussion around increasing their pay to reflect the work that they do on a daily basis. So the center of attention and integral part and component of the social emotional well-being and academic achievement is the importance of teachers building strong trusting relationships with teachers and their families as the district looks at class size it is important to consider the positive impact of how teachers will be able to do the following for their teachers when the numbers are manageable so when things are manageable we have the time to really listen to parents and children's wants their needs aspirations as a result developing very strong personal relationships with families and child. Mm -hmm. Little things matter most to the parents, being able to help with a backpack before or after school, helping with the help homework planner, extra help in learning a new concept, listening to a personal story, responding to a note, writing a note to the parents regarding the child's day. When we have 26 kids, for example, the management of that is hard. Also, when things are manageable, we have time to differentiate instruction to meet the academic and emotional needs of all students. And finally, to build a stronger sense of class community and cooperation where children feel, where children feel connected to each other and feel supported by the teacher and by one another. Mm -hmm. Elementary teachers and principals know from our school communities how valued important class size is and strong teachers uh, and strong teachers are to our learners. This has been a top priority in elementary schools uh, uh, improvement plans across the nation for years. We have a deep understanding of the complex challenges that present in our model of the inclusive classroom. Take the makeup of an inclusive example, uh, the inclusive classroom for example of 24 children. Okay? Uh, you can have three advanced learners, three on individualized education programs, nine typical children, two children with 504s diagnosed with ADD, OCD, ADHD, or a medical disability, three above average, two children with behavioral challenges, and two with emotional issues seeing a social worker twice a week. Mm -hmm. Our teachers are often creating multiple individual common core curriculum related lessons to meet the needs of these diverse learners each day. Teachers are responsible for demonstrating the growth through data obtained from assessment. For example, it's possible that within one classroom, students are taking multiple tests to measure reading. What has been described as lacking in, America, in American education is students' ability to problem solve and think critically. Developing these skills in students takes time for the teacher to collaborate with the children, to bring out and enhance their ability in deep, at deep levels. The main focus of curriculum initiatives is individualization and differentiation. As a result of these two come developing varied groupings. The more complex the skill, the more flexible groupings are needed. Teachers need to understand each student's skill level to enrich, review, and practice. 
Our belief and our experience tell us that creating strong literacy foundation is the key to future academic success for the 21st century learners. As you know, 21st century basics are not only reading, writing, and math. They also include communication, higher problem solving skills, along with scientific and technological literacy. The thinking tools that allow us to understand the technological world around us. All students, not only tomorrow's scientists, not only the advanced and the fortunate, need these new basics. All students need a firm grounding in mathematics, science, and technology. We are preparing our children in elementary school for future jobs, and for some jobs that don't even exist today. Mm -hmm. The classroom is a dynamic place, constantly changing based on the complexities of students and multifaceted components of the curriculum. Teachers struggle with coverage versus in-depth understanding. Mm -hmm. Coverage is what some of us experienced in school, rote learning, in large classes. In-depth understanding is developed through experimentation, discussion, and project-based learning. Lower class sizes allow teachers to participate in each of these activities. They need to be able to provide time for children to engage in quality lessons and to get in-depth feedback on their assignments. We also value teaching assistance. Teaching assistants are the lifeline to supporting the diverse needs of the students with specific profiles, at the same time assisting teachers with inclusive, flexible grouping format that I mentioned earlier. I move on to the need for additional behavioral specialists in the district. Teachers encounter situations where they need guidance, expertise, and support of behavior specialists in the school or community. The social and behavioral climate of a classroom can reflect the climate of the school more broadly. Behavior specialists play a key role in addressing the contributions of school-wide strategies or programs to improve student behavior. Behavior is learned. Children's behaviors are shaped by the expectations and examples provided by important adults in their lives and by their peers. In the elementary grade, general education classroom teachers are arguably the most important adults at school for the large majority of our students. As such, they can play a critical role both in proactively teaching and reinforcing appropriate student behaviors and reducing the frequency of behaviors that impede learning. Accepting responsibility for the behavior learning of all students is a natural extension of the responsibility for the academic learning of all students that general education teachers exercise with such purpose every day. The goal of attaining additional behavioral support personnel in the Arlington Public Schools elementary schools is to help carry out their dual responsibility by recommending ways to shape and manage classroom behavior so that teaching and learning can be effective. Rounding out our recommendations is the need to develop a job description as I mentioned specific to the library teaching assistant position, recla reclassification and to increase their pay. The elementary library assistants they're a distinct group within the district in that they, don't work, they do not work under the direction of a teacher or learning specialist like most TAs do. They are acting more as paraprofessionals rather than assistants with more responsibility for whole classes of students as well as a significant amount of administrative functions. So just to give you an idea of some of the, the, uh, the um, roles that a library teaching assistant uh, provides. They advocate for the library through the effective public relations program. They, administrate, uh, they administer the library budget to support program goals, book collection, book purchases, supplies for the library and multimedia. Establishes procedures for selection, acquisition, circulation, and resource sharing of all resources in all formats. Process catalogs and circulates books in other print and non-print library materials including mobile technology devices. And the list goes on, I have seven other bullets that I could uh, rattle off. These library teaching assistants are doing librarian work. Library teaching assistants deserve more financially to reflect the work that they do for our schools. In summary, educational research identifies three top factors that significantly increase student achievement. The opportunity to learn, time, and assessment slash progress monitoring. Low class sizes and teaching assistants allow our teachers to provide increased opportunities to learn, more time to spend with children on academic tasks, and an increased ability to assess learning to provide meaningful feedback. 
At the elementary level, we firmly believe that the single best way to provide a quality education is by maintaining this lower class size and maintaining the staffing based on enrollment and the increasing numbers and increasing the number of qualified teaching assistants. The community's expectation of teachers, students, and schools has increased steadily in many ways. Some of the increased expectations uh, are created through changes in the law, mass, mass ed reform, while others have been necessitated by the increased complexity of the world in which we live. Meeting these expectations requires teachers' attentions to students supported by teaching assistants, behavioral specialists, parents, and principals. Thank you. Um, any, any other principals want to take an opportunity to, to speak before we open up to questions? Okay, why don't we go ahead and start? Can I ask all my questions? Or are we doing it one <laughs> at a time? <laughs> um, I have three. Okay. All right. Go for it. All right. So my first question is, um, what would you say should be the maximum class size of any grade? And I know kindergarten, it might, you know, I understand that different grades might be different, but that's exactly what I'm looking for. So in your recommendation, what would be the mm -hmm. maximum class size that we should have? I, I think developmentally and philosophically as you said Cindy um, the um, kindergarten first and even you know second grades should be seriously considered and um, capped or um, you know around 20 20 is a very manageable number and kindergarten is 20 is a little high 18 would be a, pre a preferred number um, and whereas three four and five 22 kids is is manageable once you start getting past 22 kids the real estate alone in the classroom is hard as far as where you put these kids and the, the pedagogy is sort of your approach to, to teaching and best practice because you just don't have any room to move. Um, so those numbers, and correct me if I'm wrong team, but are numbers that we would like to see maintained in our schools. Okay, great. Um, my second question is um, on the behavioral specialists. Do we, how many do we have now, and how many would you ideally like to see? Uh, you know, actually, we have um, one of our uh, special education administrators, both of them actually back there. And so in case I, I misspeak, um, we have two BCBAs right now in the district, and then each one of them has a behavioral support person um, attended upon them. So there's really four behavioral specialists, um, one of them in a senior position for each junior. So four in the district Correct. total that we have now. Correct, it's four. And ideally we need... <laughs> <coughs> Double that. <laughs> At least one in every school? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. That's less than double, that's all, right, you know. Right. <laughs> All right, um, and my last question is on teaching assistants, basically the same question. How many do we have and how many do we need? And I assume actually that that's probably more a relation to how many students are in the class. So if we were at 20 and 22, would we need fewer assistants? And is it, so once we go above that, is there like an assistant needed for every four or I, I don't know if there's a formula I'm, I'm a math person so I'm always looking for the numbers it's hard to say a number in particular you know as, as you explained but I can give an example I have a fifth grade with 26 students in it with um, probably uh, close to the same proportions that uh, Mr. McEnany was describing before with students of all uh, you know different needs and there's a teacher in there <clears throat> running reading groups by herself um, and you can imagine with 26 students how many reading groups you'd have to have with one teacher, no TA. It's, it's, it's very challenging. She's doing a fabulous job and not complaining. Um, but when you look at that, you think, you know, that is, is just an unbelievable feat. So basically, um, any, any class that is above these ideal numbers mm -hmm. would need some kind of an assistant. Yeah. Right. I okay. would say yes. That, that's a great, that's just... Again, so that I can do the math. Thanks. That's it. Thanks very much. That was a great presentation. If, if you were to prioritize the four things I think you outlined, which would be class sizes, more TAs, <coughs> um, redefining or better defining the library, teaching the library position, and then the behavioral specialist. If you had to prioritize this, 
what would you, well, maybe have there's seven different. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I, I, well, I, and I, it was enough they got it before. I know, I know, I know. I'm aware. I'm aware. We of might not all agree on this, but I will say one thing that is on the table today that we we would really like considered is the librarian teaching assistant position to be heard, reclassified, and, and looked at. I know that we can agree on that. Okay. Because we've talked about it for several years and nothing's been done for a long time. And we all have like young parents that are unbelievably talented people. Um, and um, even asking, I have someone now that is amazing and is getting her library masters. So might as well. Yeah. And reclassifying them has some budget ramification. Absolutely. Yeah. I have to, we don't know that number, okay. obviously. Right, okay. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Could then I if there was a oh. second break, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, that it also lends itself to the technology rollout that we've been doing yeah. to have the libraries um, available mm -hmm. as a, you know, as it's called these days, a learning commons for mm -hmm. uh, that kind of collaborative work that Mark was describing in the classrooms. A lot of potential if, if we can legitimately ask that of our librarians. Is there a second priority? Yeah. I think that's probably true. We, we are trying really hard in our, in our buildings to build our capacity in a regular ed setting <coughs> to help students, mm -hmm. as Mark was talking about, access this, this common core curriculum and help children become college and career ready. And it's a struggle for some kids to do that, to even get to access that curriculum due to behavioral challenges. So in order for us in the regular ed setting to increase that capacity and that ability, we need the support to do that. Um, especially where right now those class sizes are not at that ideal place. So not only are you experiencing children that are having this, this issue, but you're, you're experiencing that in a room full of 25 children. So in, in order to get behavior plans in place for children and keep them in the least restrictive environment, keep them in the regular ed setting, you really need a specific mm -hmm. type of support. Um, and those behavioral specialists can give us that. So, you know, that would be, and I think I speak for the team in saying that would be a real priority for us. Okay, thank you. Um, I know from the parent perspective, an additional teacher is something very tangible for them to see because it does mean there's one more classroom to mm -hmm. divide up their children. Um, based on what we've heard over the years about the different programs, for us, we can see how a library assistant that actually is um, also teaching and how a behavior specialist would actually produce some of those um, responsibilities that might otherwise fall on the teacher. I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more to the ways in which that would support a classroom teacher and give their time for direct children, direct student interaction? I'm sorry, I'm not saying that. Give them more time for direct student interaction. Oh, the TA staffing? Well, no, in terms of like the behaviorist oh. and the librarian, where they're not resources that go directly to the classroom, but from our perspective, they are things that do actually benefit the teacher's ability to access their students. And yeah. I'm wondering if, if anybody would feel comfortable talking about that. Sure. <laughs> There's not enough of us. We thought we'd have an eight. <laughs> We, we like it when people bring in the specialists. <laughs> and I think that's what you're asking for, too. Hello, good evening, thank you. I'm Jill Parkin. I'm one of the elementary um, coordinators with Chris Carlson, and um, I have an expertise in behavior, um, behavior analysis, so that's why they brought me here. <laughs> um, right now in the district, we have two um, professional master's levels behavior specialist, um, board certified, and we also have two higher level um, district-wide assistants who are specially trained. And um, these personnel work directly um, with the social workers in the building, so I do want to acknowledge that the school committee has supported the district in expanding the social work um, arena in all of our schools and I think all of the principals would agree that that's a great resource. I think the um, what the behavior analysts bring along with their assistance is kind of a, an expertise in looking at more of the intensive behavioral issues and how to arrange the environment to facilitate learning 
for those children, but most importantly for the classroom, because it, um, when you have a social worker, they do direct work with the kids. They really deal with in the moment, they're in the buildings. Um, but it's really nice to have some experts to look at um, the more in-depth look at what are the functions of behaviors, what are the accommodations that really need to be put in place for kids. Um, the behavior support personnel, the assistants go directly into the classroom. Those are hands-on personnel that go in to implement behavior support plans. They go right into the classroom, they work with kids, they're hands-on, they're specialized teaching assistants, they're district-wide, all of us at the table, including Chris, um, support these positions. They're, they're essential positions to keep kids learning to try the work, to do the deed, to really implement the plans that are in place and extend the work that the social workers are doing. There's two of them for seven elementary schools. And I have found that those two personnel um, for all of the creative positions that the school committee has supported us on have really made a difference and I think we would all agree. Um, and, um, and it's hard, it's, it's like you put them in one place then another place, so they truly are um, kind of like in select places as we need them. Um, so um, regarding the specific nature of things, obviously that's not gonna get decided tonight, but I would look forward to just um, being one of the people that would help look at what the issues are, look at what the data is about how we have utilized these people. They do a lot of evaluations, um, also in alignment with the social workers. So I think there needs to be an in-depth look, and I appreciate the question, but those are some examples. And, and Jill, as you were talking, I was thinking about, and, and I had mentioned us building our capacity to really uh, service children that have these issues in the regular ed setting. And having, having the consistency of uh, someone with that specific of a talent that's really helping children access what they need to access, it's, it's really many folds. And one of them being that we become proactive instead of reactive. So we're not trying to treat in a crisis, which is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. We also become able to train teachers the right way to intervene for kids. And the more examples they see of that and the more consistent of a plan that is delivered around behavior management, the more they pick up on these things and they feel confident implementing them. Um, and you know, maybe we, the next time we're at a level where we can do some intervening before you know, it becomes a crisis. So you know, for me, especially as one of the newer principals on the team, um, I think that that's where my staff and, and, and I really want to build our capacity that would be so helpful. Just one more follow-up. So what I'm also hearing is that this would actually be a tier two intervention as well for our students at the elementary level that um, are not necessarily having complete success with their teachers and therefore need more support, but we want to pretty much give them, give them that support as early and appropriately as possible so that they don't become great, have greater needs later on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the topics that's been brought before us is the growth in enrollment um, in the district. Would you care to comment or bring forth any uh, descriptions for us of how that's impacted your building at this point? There's more kids there. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's a surprise, and so, um, you know, I have a building that was built larger than the population that I had, but it, it's now almost to the amount mm -hmm. that's the capacity in the building. Um, you know, you always expect uh, the new coming kindergartners. You don't always expect huge numbers in other grades, mm -hmm. and um, so, you're dealing with figuring out the personalities of all your kindergartners, but then you're also figuring, you've got four or five kids in third grade that are brand new, you know nothing about them, and um, they may not have wanted to have moved. 
<laughs> so, uh, so that's where it hits the most. It's those, it's those kids. It's not the kindergarten kids because they're all new, but it's, it's those. Mm -hmm. And particularly if they come in and they are very dysregulated kids, kids who have been struggling in school for years, um, uh, then you need to jump really fast mm -hmm. to supply them with services that you can see that they need right away. And you might not have all the manpower to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really one of the reasons that um, having the behaviorists in the building, um, you see how that can be helpful in getting your kids' situations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this year, getting so many kids, mm -hmm. um, it would have been fabulous to have more. On a very basic level, space. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't have an extra inch at mm -hmm. our school. Dallin is the same, actually. Mm -hmm. Dallin's space. 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 And also the teachers toward a data-driven instruction mm -hmm. and really thinking about where kids are and how we move them to the next place and how we look at data. That's really hard to do with 27 children in your room. Mm -hmm. um, you you, you want to be able to give those assessments yourself because anecdotally you get a lot of information from more than just the numbers. But you can't always you can't always do that in a manner in which you're you're getting the most because that's times 27 for reading, times 27 for writing, mm -hmm. times 20. It's a, it's a lot. That's what I'm hearing teachers say a lot about the beginning of the year, that mm -hmm. they just wish they had more time and less to do. And, and in, increasingly, in order to kind of remedy the fact that you've got 27 mm -hmm. at most, you know, usually 23 patients in front of you and you're diagnosing and mm -hmm. prescribing all at once, mm -hmm. um, we've also created times in our schedule for more homogeneous groups to be created. And that's grand, but we need then the TAs to be fielding those homogeneous groups. You know, we might have um, in a grade three, there's three classrooms. On a given assessment, we'd really like to have seven groups of kids mm -hmm. uh, according to assessment data, but we need the, the people there to lead the groups. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting pretty good at pulling different people from different places. Everyone kind of all hands on deck, but the, the more people we have, the more fine the instruction is. That leads us to the second question. If you're talking about lowering the class size, where do we put the classes? <laughs> and question number three, I'm going to go and, and be the hard one, because I, I don't expect, I, I, unless you have any great ideas of space within your buildings where we can start putting extra classes. We could use a fourth floor. A fourth floor, <laughs> OK. Um, and the third one is the uh, awful school committee question that as we're looking at budgets which are limited and if you're asking us to add something, what are we doing that maybe we shouldn't be doing or might prioritize lower and maybe not do next year? And I also won't make you answer that question before the cameras unless you choose to. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I would invite you to make sure that uh, the administration uh, has both sides of the equation because it will be easier to add things uh, to your wish list if there are things that we can sort of ease up on uh, that maybe were a good idea a few years ago that we don't need to be doing right now. this woman who's uh, written a popular and very unpopular book mm -hmm. looking at sports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh boy. If you get rid of sports, <laughs> you'll have all the money you need. <laughs> I know in Arlington that's like the worst thing to say. But I, uh, we don't have any sports at the elementary level. No, <laughs> no but I'm saying you do it there and then everyone gains. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So you want to take from the secondary to give to the elementary? Oh, just, I see, I see. I, I know, I'm just, I, I'm just I, look, I, I do this for, uh, for a day job, too, and, and I'm looking elsewhere in the district to meet my needs. So, uh, you know, I, I, I feel your pain and would, would like to, to see efficiencies, but I think that when we go for trade-offs, I think that uh, 
Uh, I, it's difficult to come in with, with a wish list unless you've got, also got some things you could give up at the same time. Well, last year when we did talk about our new RTI model at the elementary school, um, that is something that happened. We did give up uh, some TAs mm -hmm. in each building. Um, but we're also hearing tonight that that was a sacrifice for something that we thought would be, and, and it is, mm -hmm. in fact, if you'd like to talk to them about that, you, you can. But I would say that we are very lean, very lean, and I think they'd be very hard pressed. It's not just the cameras rolling, really. Mm -hmm. And if, if I could, I just make another comment on this. You're hearing um, principals talk about their, their sights on what's really necessary for mm -hmm. the education of children. But what they're also not saying is the enormous burdens that they are facing. Mm -hmm. We have two principals here who have schools almost to 500. Mm -hmm. And uh, other districts were looking at more administrative support mm -hmm. or more support just for the, the operational functions of the building. Mm -hmm. But they as a group would rather put additional money into supporting the children in their building. So as I, <laughs> as Superintendent, I need mm -hmm. to point that out because mm -hmm. this is something that concerns me is the load that they are experiencing as well. And the second thing, too, which uh, we have been working on, I think, very creatively and very effectively, in fact, I'll talk about that in my superintendent's report, is we have such talented elementary teachers who have really stepped mm -hmm. up to taking a lead in technology mm -hmm. and being the leaders in their building. But we have for a Elementary, or seven mm -hmm. elementary schools, mm -hmm. over <coughs> children, we have a 0.5 in mm -hmm. technology special, mm -hmm. instructional special, mm -hmm. in a district that is trying and has been moving forward significantly in um, expanding technology to enhance teaching and learning. So we have some other issues mm -hmm. there as well. Um, but as you can hear from their priorities, it, it's, it's all about mm -hmm. the children. If, if I can say, I don't understand the whole acquisition of more money to a district or to a town. Mm -hmm. So, but listening and, and thinking that we have to give something up to get, to get additional is frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, something has to give. We need to find more money somehow and I don't know how you do that and I and when you uh, you poll uh, principals across the nation you read any uh, educational leadership article on principal and whether or not that they're happy with their jobs and you're going to find 63 percent of them that are unhappy and stressed with their jobs right mm -hmm. now because of the demands that we hold and so it is it's frustrating to think that we have to give something up in order for us you know, to present this tonight and to be heard and to be considered. There's, Kathy brought up something about um, the, I guess the, the understaffing of our technology specialists. I just wanted to make a comment that increasing the, the scope of responsibilities for our um, library assistants mm -hmm. um, could very well also address uh, some of that instructional need around uh, technology. Um, first, I don't think that Mr. Schlickman's desire to ask you if there's something that you would want to give up is an indication of his own wishes. It's an understanding that we have a finite pie and mm -hmm. we can only slice it. And if mm -hmm. we slice it this way, then we can't do the big quarters or something. Mm -hmm. So it's we are working as best we can as a committee and as a town towards making that pie bigger, but we aren't in total control of that. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. that my, so. my comments weren't directed to the committee by any means. It's just my frustration as as we have these discussions and we look at you know our fiscal challenges and what we need in today's world. This keeps growing. And we can't afford to cut back on what we're doing right now. We need to take what we have, and we need we need additional support. We agree. Mm -hmm. We agree. Uh -huh. So my actual question was just, 
a sense of whether the need for more behavioral specialists is related to the push out of the inclusion model this year in the classrooms and whether you know it is that is one the relation related to the other or is it I think wondering that where that's coming from I think this is my first year for sure but I you know being a teacher in the system as well I don't think this is new okay. you know I, I think that the support the challenges that are coming to us in elementary school at a young age you know it is it's increased for for whatever reason um, and I as speaking from the teacher perspective from it's always your biggest challenge it's always your biggest challenge on you know I have a skill set and my skill set is to is to deliver this instruction in the best way that I can and reach all the children in my room. And the textbook didn't cover this. I you know I don't know how to get I don't even know how to get in. I think that's always been there. I don't think that it's necessarily our shift in the inclusionary model. As a matter of fact, it's probably too early to tell since it's only been a few months. But my guess is that, and I'm sure I share the rest of the the team's guess is that as we get more proficient at this model and this push-in model um, we're adding another skill set to our classrooms i anticipate it to get better um, you know once we have really fleshed out how this is going to work and once we are able to really use the tas that are um, direct that are attached to the specific special ed liaisons in specific grade levels as we get better at using them that way i anticipate it will get better um, <clears throat> so I, I guess the, in short, I don't think so. I don't think so. Would you agree? Yep. Okay. Um, before I go for a second. <laughs> um, thank you again for everything you've done. Uh, I'd like to state at the outset, my daughter is a school librarian in an adjacent town. Uh, as a teacher, uh, half my career I had full-time librarians in the school, and then for the same reason it happened in this community, the financial constraints, uh, <coughs> they were dropped. Uh, I applaud the, I heard two of you say that uh, your uh, people are going towards certification. I would ask you and uh, my colleagues to consider in this study for this, that we may be able to support all of them to go there. Mm -hmm. As an, a former educator, the value of a, a good school librarian cannot be measured. Um, they do more than checkbooks in and out. In fact, most of them don't do that anymore as full, uh, certified librarians. They provide phenomenal skills in support of the regular classroom teacher. And if I could write a check for anything right now, that would be the first thing. I've talked about it since the day I came on the committee. The need for us to have this back at the library and to support uh, the books and not be dependent on the wonderful parents that we had in this community uh, in, in the books. The other thing I'd like to just suggest to all of us is the idea in class sizes I experienced the idea of a weighted uh, class where you could you, we all know that the larger the class size the less time the the teacher or a TAs or whatever it can spend with the individual student some children require more than other students so I'd ask you to consider when you're arranging your classes uh, that the classes be if possible within the constraints of, of uh, the law and everything to consider how much time these students are requiring from their teacher. Uh, difficult to do in the kindergarten, but you, you do have data from the, the, after kindergarten. I can remember having a class in my building of 18 students at my grade level, and I had a class of 25. And to be quite frank, I chose the 25 students because it just isn't the amount of seats in the room. You as educators know that. Thank you. process of putting classes together is lengthy, lengthy at every school, and we all have really intricate processes for that. Um, sometimes a mistake is made here or there, but they aren't that many. They are really carefully done. But when you get a lot of new students, um, that's where you can get into trouble. And um, the other thing is, I just want you to know that I'm not the only person that's done this, but in the past two year, years that I've been out of my building, I haven't done it because I was too busy with so many other things, but the previous years, I visited every preschool. I found every kid that was coming in town into my kindergarten, kindergarten classes so that I could be ready for what was coming. I didn't mean to make, if that came off as a criticism, I didn't mean so. I just, when, we, when you were asked, 
what the ideal class size is, I do know that 22 can mean three, three or four different things. Those, that's yeah. where I was trying to say it. Maybe I should have said it now. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could um, maybe elaborate on what kind of behavior behavior specialists deal with. Um, I, I don't, it's not, I've been reading a lot lately about how the lack of play and the need to now have a curriculum in kindergarten is really degrading students, not having the time to just play and deal with all the social issues that we used to let them deal with in kindergarten. And now that we have all this curriculum um, and the massive difference that's making in children and the number of behavior issues that actually come out of doing that. And I, so I don't, I want to better understand is, is it coming out of that? Is it, or are these like behaviors that are beyond that? I, I just want to better understand what a behavior specialist does, I guess, and what kind of behaviors we're seeing. And I, th I think we all have experiences and opinions, but I do want um, Jill, if she could, to respond to how she charges her, her staff. I would say that it's not all related to play. <laughs> um, um, that's not to say that's not an important component in the kindergarten. I do miss the kitchens. Um, but um, kids are presenting with, with, a, with a, an ability to, or with, a, they don't present with an ability to regulate. So kids are not able to self-regulate um, more than, than, there's a need there. There's a reason why we have social workers in every building. So that's like a piece of it. It's the social, emotional, behavioral presentations of kids that has increased. Um, kids on the autism spectrum, um, obviously we all know that there's a huge amount of funds that have gone into that. Um, there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of educational modules in place to address those kids' needs. But the kids that are coming forth now are different kinds of kids. Seriously traumatized children. Mm -hmm. We just have a larger percentage of our children have increased. Increased, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it's pretty acute. I mean, our, our gen ed, you know, I'll speak for my staff, I know the rest, they can handle a lot. Um, and these are anomalies that generally our um, behavioral specialists are, are working with. Um, but it's an increasing number of anomalies. Huh. And have the anomalies that have the capacity <coughs> gone on inter if we don't intervene to to, to derail classrooms sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And I know. I, I like to call it like my my new when I talk with my with my staff now. I say, is this an in between Z or is this something that we really you know that and you know what I mean by an in between Z is you know what what you say that we have the capacity our teachers have the capacity to deal with a lot so when you have a teacher coming to you and saying help you know it's gotten there and I think that's happening more often than it used to like just in, as an example like I'm a person of anecdotes I mean we have kids who run out of classrooms when they get upset they might stay in the building they might not stay in the building that's a safety issue um, that's a child who needs to learn how to learn a way to deal with when they're upset. Right. We have curriculum in place. We have the social thinking, social cognition curriculum. We have the open circle curriculum. We're utilizing all of that. It's a general ed initiative. It's a combination of special ed, general ed. It's a whole school. I've never been in a district that does more whole school addressing of children's needs. It's a gift for Chris and I to be here, truly. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there's not some individual nature of the programming that needs to be in place. And that's why I think the principals are kind of putting <coughs> forth kind of a request. Um, because when you have children who sometimes run, when you have children who sometimes hit, who sometimes mm -hmm. injure themselves, um, who sometimes become verbally so dysregulated that they're, um, they're not just not following teachers' directions, they're, I'm trying to use the right words, 
Um, they might do it in a way that appears as disrespectful. They might, there's a lot of that kind of verbal language that's some of the most difficult behavior to manage is verbal behavior. Um, and it's all done for different reasons for different kids. Um, there's kids that come in that don't get enough to eat. There's kids that come in that haven't slept a lot, that don't feel well. There's also kids who just have different brains and um, so that they're, they're, they need to learn in a different way. So there's all kinds of etiologies. It's not just one factor, which is why you have to really take a professional specialist look at it. It's not just one answer because it's not just one kid. But the behaviors that are presented sometimes are safety issues. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes more than just extra staff in the classroom because no matter how many staff you have, if the other kids don't feel safe at times, that's a problem for all of us. I mean, the kids are there to access the curriculum. So it's, it's that kind of, a, of an anecdote. That's what it looks like. It's like putting the district-wide behavior specialist in one school in the morning and another school in the afternoon because you do the best that you can to kind of manage what you have. And one one follow-up question. Do the, the behavioral specialists, do they help teach teachers how to deal with this? So, so over time, they also are learning these, right? And so it's kind of a coaching and a, okay, all right, great. It has to be because it's remedying those presenting behaviors in the context, right. so it has to be right in the classroom. Right. And, and, and the language of behavior plans has to be the same. It's, right. it's behaviorism, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty tight. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay, thank you, that helps, helps a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you. I have, to, I have to add, you know, for me, and, and at, at the bishop and from my experience around behavioral support, um, and Jill alluded to it, is, is safety. And when we have behaviors that can be classified as bullying, uh, and when I think about or when I look into a particular child's eyes and, and see uh, malicious intent, um, I'm not a specialist. I'm not a behavior specialist. I need someone to turn to, and I need a team of professionals mm -hmm. to work with mm -hmm. to not only help this child, but to educate me, my staff, and the families, and to get the, that child and, and those families the support that they need. And so the, the behavior specialists and social workers, thank you f for that again, um, are wonderful resources, invaluable. <laughs> and you know, and once you have, once they do visit and you have them, you, you go and you take them. You sit them down and say, I have you for a minute's hour. I need to get all of these things out. You, you, you really learn, you really teach, them, and they take the time to teach you. So that is, that is our direction. You, once, once he comes in, do not let him leave unless I've seen him first. Um, I just wanted to thank you all again because in the, this is my sixth time that I've heard the elementary principals come before us and talk about the needs of the building. And this is the most <coughs> voice and message I've heard over these six years. I mean, to the point of asked to prioritize, you know, which of these are the top, which one's the second. Mm -hmm. So it really, um, while we do have difficult choices to make with our budget, it does make it so much easier for us to know that you are all uniformly behind the same suggestions. So thank you for that. I just want to make a comment because I know that a lot of people listen to this and which is I think also why this, it's very powerful to hear the leaders of our elementary schools talking about this. But what they are talking about is not just Arlington, going on in Arlington. This is go these issues are rampant in this state, in this country. And we have a tremendous focus right now on data and improving scores and all of these things, which are important. There's none of us here that does not think student achievement is important. But I think it's good for you to hear this because you have to understand that, uh, some of the challenges that face schools um, in moving in this direction because the the curriculum that our children are expected to master has become much 
uh, uh, much more uh, robust. There have been certainly math, science that have may have been taught at upper grades that are now taught at lower grades. We have very, we have very uh, uh, challenging standards that we have to meet, but we are also doing it in the context of having students be able to access that curriculum and what are the things that perhaps stand in the way. And, and one of our principals mentioned the, the, you know, the issue is some children come hungry. We, we do have a breakfast program. But this is, you know, there are towns, d cities in this state where that is, remains an issue. So, and, and maybe we'll, we'll say something a little bit about some recent stuff that's been going on with the Globe, and they talk about fourth grade scores going down a couple points. You cannot look at this without looking at the whole picture of what is going on in our society that may be not about, about anything that's at the schools. The schools increasingly are picking up a lot of the, um, the challenges that are being presented by our society. And um, we, we see this more and more in terms of social services, in terms of all of the support and counseling. You know, the principals all came together a couple years ago and said we need to have social workers in every school, and we do. That is extremely important. Um, we are very fortunate, and I will say this in Arlington, that we do have this. This is not universal. And so it's a lot of credit to, the, to, to all of you and to the community that we have been able to provide this. But without these kinds of supports in a school building that help teachers deal with the range of students that are in their classrooms, <coughs> um, you, you can't expect to have high achievement. In, in all of these things. The, the Common Core is a very rigorous program and just thinking about you know just the writing alone that we're asking teachers to have our students do, to correct and to give feedback on a timely basis so that there is just a, a constant flow of this is that in and of itself would be a challenge and you layer all of all of this else. So it's good for people to understand the challenges that are facing our schools today because and it's not just Arlington I really want to say that it is really a much much broader issue that that we need to look at as a society and as a state yeah I, I think that uh, one of the things that I've learned this year at work is the value of a good social worker I could not live without my social worker right now and that resonates with me a lot because of the things that I'm seeing among early childhood, early elementary children that are, that are, that are coming up. Uh, the other thing that, that I'm concerned about uh, on a regular basis uh, is the quality of life and the quality of, uh, the quality of life of our principals and the uh, the, the world you're living in and how it is coming to work every day and uh, recruiting, retaining strong leaders. And so that uh, I, the, the superintendent describes you as an unselfish lot uh, who are looking to do things for others and not yourself. I would like to make sure that somewhere is in the budget process, if there are things we could do, particularly the little things, to make your world a little bit better, uh, as you're doing this work for us, please let them come to us and don't hold back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you. you very much. Um, I, d I, I think I speak for the, the team also to just cite uh, the, you know, the clear support and teaming that, that we feel from this committee and uh, want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to you tonight and have this great exchange. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're a little ahead of schedule. As a practical matter, I don't know if the people are sitting over there are cold. I can oh, turn that yeah. off. How, yes. How it's freezing. Yeah. Is it freezing over there? Yeah. Yeah. It's freezing over here. It's cold. It's cold. I, don't, I wouldn't want off because I wouldn't want to go to the other extreme, but uh, certainly a little warmer would be We bad. can bring it cold quickly. Uh -huh. okay. We can let it warm up. <laughs> I wish it had the gradations. We didn't ask about the temperature in the elementary schools. How is the temperature? <laughs> How is the temperature? <laughs> it's fine. 
No. Um, Even no. ask them. Don't uh, ask them. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Um, I'm going to pay for that. Stop no. it. Um, no, yes. Yeah, Did the elementary principals hear that question? Hit, hit that Do we need AC in the turn elementary schools? Yeah. Third floor in the summer. Just to in introduce the segment, um, and by all means, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't think I uh, related last segment to our goals, and I really would like to do that for the public. Um, when we're hearing from the elementary principals, we were hearing on our goal three, which has to do with resources, infrastructure, and educational environment uh, in our schools. And right now, we're, we're going to bridge to um, uh, the new curri kindergarten curriculum, which is called Tools of the Mind, um, and this relates to our goal number two, uh, point three, which is that kindergarten teachers will be supported <coughs> with professional development to implement the Tools of the Mind program in all of our kindergartens starting in September of this year, and this is quite a comprehensive manual. I haven't seen this yet, Ms. Donovan. I don't know if my, my members have, have had a chance to look at it. Um, if you'd like to start, I'm sure we'll okay. have some questions after. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a history um, of where Tools of the Mind came um, and when it came into the Arlington Public Schools. When I first came here six and a half years ago, um, Mary Villani was, Villano was the kind of um, the head of all things kindergarten and um, what had been going on for a few years was that um, we had this combination of things going to support the kindergarten programs here. We were hooked up with an agency that would accredit um, the kindergartens and um, every five years a massive amount of paperwork had to be collected. We had to be inspected and every year a massive amount of paperwork had to be collected. Um, so people had been doing that for a while and um, the accreditation program, I mean, uh, a program went along fine except no one liked it. Um, but we did it in order to get a grant uh, for money to support the kindergarten um, program here. And par partially that money supported the teaching assistants that were in the kindergarten. Um, Mary began talking uh, about, you know, we really need to find another way to do this. And everyone agreed, or most kindergarten teachers agreed. And so she began looking at what else is out there that um, will drive us in the same direction to be able to continually get this grant because we have been uh, chosen as exemplary program. Um, so she looked at, I mean, she talked about several things, um, but the one program that she really, really liked was the Tools of the Mind program. And um, I wasn't so convinced in the beginning. I read some stuff about it. Um, uh, the way it was set up for us was that some schools in Arlington that wanted to could pilot the program for two years so we could look at it in action. We could train some people. Um, that wouldn't cost us a lot of money. We would be gathering data for NYU. NYU, yeah. And um, we would, um, we could watch it. We could watch this happen and make a judgment at the end of two years whether this really was a solid program and one we wanted to continue. So that's what we did. Um, I didn't see a lot of people leaping forward to uh, being trained and becoming tools um, uh, classrooms through the pilot. Um, so I thought, you know, I need to look at this again. Maybe there's something in here that would be really right for my school. And I did a lot more digging and realized that I almost passed up a really good opportunity. So I, um, I agreed to pilot it with three classes. Hardy did three classes and Stratton did one. And then there was a, um, uh, what did you have? A control group at brackets. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so for the last two years, 
I've been able to watch it in my school and have been really, really pleased with what my teachers have learned, what they were doing. I've been really pleased with the learning of the children in uh, these classes. Um, I have been terribly impressed with the amount of hard work it is. I, I mean, I was watching a complete transformation of, um, of teaching. And I, I was very, very impressed with the hard work of my teachers um, and very impressed with the results. So in the end of last year, um, we, there were several meetings. I wasn't involved in organizing those, but I went to a couple in which um, the decision was tossed around about we need to make a decision about tools. Um, and eventually, it was uh, decided that um, all three schools, all the teachers, the seven teachers who were involved in the training really were very happy with what they were doing and saw great benefits for, for children. Um, and we decided to uh, go with this curriculum as a, an entire district. And that meant a lot of money being committed towards training um, and many people um, spending hours and hours and hours learning to do something that they did, and some of them, many of them did very, very well, learning another way to do this, to teach kindergarten uh, students. So um, let me tell you a little bit about the program. Um, <clears throat> it is a research-based program. It builds on a strong foundation for school success, meaning that it doesn't just benefit kindergarten children. The research is beginning to show that they're following these children, and it's beginning to show the benefits continue as they go through school. Um, <clears throat> One of the most important parts about the tools program is that is the piece of self-regulation. And self-regulation in young children is really executive function. So you're learning executive function skills at a very young age. Um, what does that really mean? It means things like this. Children gain greater capacity to control, control their impulses. Um, they are more easily able to stop when asked to stop and move on to another project. And um, they have greater ease with starting something new that might be really new and challenging. Um, it helps children behave the same way if adult is present or not. Um, children are more readily to experience delayed gratification It often suppresses impulses that uh, just long enough for children to actually consider the consequences or alternate actions. It doesn't help. I mean, all of these things that I'm that I'm talking about. Uh, it it isn't the same for every child, but the um, but every child can gain in this way um, to a certain um, degree. Um, the findings of the research that they're doing uh, show that self-regulation is not limited just to social emotional, um, <clears throat> the, the social emotional uh, piece of the pie, but also um, can apply to cognitive behaviors like remembering and paying attention. Um, so as we kind of talked before, um, we have a lot of children that come into kindergarten um, without a lot of uh, self-regulation skills. And th therefore, in many ways, they are not ready and we're not ready for um, the programs that we had designed for, for, for them in kindergarten. So, um, <clears throat> so how does TOOLS teach self-regulation? It's taught by embedding classroom activities with specific support and, and assistance, scaffolding, um, that fosters self-regulation. In other words, it's not taught on its own, but it's taught within the K curriculum. Um, so I'm not going to go into depth about this either, but it's taught in two kind of basic ways. Um, <clears throat> Children are, are listening to stories and chapter books, and then they act out the characters and actions that they've read about in a very organized way. They're not ta being taught to play. Children know how to play. But they're being taught to play in a way that is, um, 
that is organized so that they can begin to regulate themselves, help other people regulate themselves. Um, the second way that K teachers improve the quality of the play skills is to extensively play learning games um, with rules. The math program, um, if you, well, you can't really see it in there, but the math program for tools is largely games. So again, children are in situations where they have to learn certain roles, they have to learn certain <coughs> rules, and, um, <clears throat> and how to actually work together successfully. Um, so, let's see. So a tools classroom should look like this. It's a place where um, <clears throat> activities are specifically designed to promote self-regulation, and there are also activities that focus on academic skills while also giving children the opportunity to practice all of the self-regulation regulation, uh, executive functioning skills. Tools classrooms ensure that children meet state and national standards by emphasizing research-based activity content. And they, a tools classroom promotes mature play, make-believe in preschool and dramatization in kindergarten. A tools teacher is scaffolding systematically the development of students' self-regulation from being regulated by others to engaging in shared regulation to becoming masters of their own behavior. Um, tools teachers teach early literacy and mathematics. That is not thrown out and everyone's not just in a play all day long and acting out things. Um, but they <clears throat> combine it with early literacy, literacy, and literacy and mathematics with an emphasis on building underlying cognitive competencies such as reflective thinking and metacognition. And tools children gain control of their social, emotional, and cognitive behaviors by learning how to use a variety of mental tools. They practice self-regulization learning throughout the day by engaging in the, the activities that are designed for them that are developmentally appropriate self-regulation activities. They learn to regulate their own behaviors as well as, again, behaviors of friends, and they enact increasingly more complex scenarios in their imaginary play and dramatization. Um, one of the other things that I like about tools is that um, I see it being very, very appropriate for special education children. Many special education children need the activities that are done in their classes, um, the work that they're expected to do, they need it to be scaffolded. It needs to be in pieces and in parts so that they can actually get to the whole. And tools does that um, very effectively for um, children with special learning needs. Um, so this year, I want to tell you exactly what we're doing in tools. It's, we're not, of course, in the pilot anymore. We're not doing this um, <clears throat> uh, without paying any money. Um, and we're not gathering uh, data with the children that we have now for NYU. That continues, but it's with children that are getting in, uh, older. Um, so we're purchasing um, everything that we're doing so far, and this is what we're doing. Um, so uh, whereas in the pilot, teachers made a lot of their materials. Teachers still make a lot of their materials, but the kits that actually, um, the kit of materials that is a tools kit, um, were not bought for the teachers in the pilot. They are bought for every teacher that is doing tools now. So there's slightly less material making, but probably not that much. Um, <clears throat> we have a coach that is uh, visiting every classroom regularly. Um, she is she is tools trained. I don't believe she was ever a tools school teacher, but she's tooled, tools trained. Um, she observes classrooms. She sits down with teachers and talks to them about their teaching. 
her job is to help them become a strong, as strong a tools teacher as they possibly can. Um, there's also training that we're paying for where um, someone higher up with the, than a coach who has been ex had experience with tools for many years comes and does like an all day training um, for uh, kindergarten teachers. I think there are three training days this year. There's also mentoring built into this, and that is we have um, some teachers who, who know how to t teach tools of the mind, and two of them from the Hardy School, um, they are mentoring other teachers that are learning right now. Um, they uh, prepare some of the professional development that we offer during professional de development times and days um, in the district, and they also have uh, offered to the, the the teachers that are learning now dates and times to come and visit, visit their classrooms, watch them teach, and then sit down and talk about it as well. Um, so the other thing that um, is not so much a support to tools teachers right now, but is certainly um, looking at how all of this is going and making some decisions going forth, and that is a uh, kindergarten steering committee that has been in existence um, and now primarily what we talk about is tools how is it going how can it be modified um, what do we need to um, support teachers with next um, it's really a tools steering committee at this point um, another thing that is happening right now just naturally with all of the teacher teachers that were in the pilot um, they're really thinking about something that they didn't spend a lot of time thinking about in the first two years. And now they're putting together um, some ideas of what we need to do for first grade teachers that are getting tools children. Last year, um, first grade teachers went, um, they went and visited some classrooms, I believe, and maybe they had a couple of hours of training. Um, this year, every first grade teacher is going to have the opportunity and be expected to spend a day in a tools kindergarten. And I've just seen a rough draft. I didn't give it to you because it's not done and it hasn't gone before the steering committee. But um, they've made up um, a one-page document at this point about um, things that first grade teachers could do in a tools way at the beginning of the year to make the transition a little bit easier. And then fade that away if they want to or hold on to it if they want to as well. Um, Okay, so another thing that you should know about, uh, about tools is that <clears throat> during the pilot, there were things about it we didn't like. Um, the math piece of it uh, especially is very weak. It continues to be weak. So Nadine Solomon, um, <clears throat> who's a math specialist um, dealing with the elementary schools, um, she argued with the tools people about the fact that even though we were in the pilot, we would no longer continue to use just their math program. And um, they said no, I believe, and she said, well, we, we, we're not gonna budge on this. And they allowed us the second year to create a math program that is um, going back to Ka the Kathy Richardson uh, work that we had been doing before. So now that is the backbone, and all the tools games are kind of supporting that. But our, even though we're, we're, we're learning how to have uh, tools, classrooms, um, the math is already modified. Um, and the other thing that we did is that after the first year, we looked at um, the children who had had early phonics instruction in kindergarten and, um, and where they were compared to children who had had support through the foundations program and where they were at the end of the year and realized that um, it would be wise and we did it. I don't think we got permission from tools in the pilot to do it at the time, but what we did is all those children who were not learning as quickly and as easily um, their phonics and not learning to read as quickly and easily, we provided them with um, the foundations starting in January. And um, we saw better results. So we're, wa we're watching that also very carefully. So that's my recommendation to, um, 
tools teachers is that those children struggling with early reading, um, they should pick up foundations, foundations um, in January of this year. So again, that's another blend. The other blend that we've done is um, <clears throat> not as extreme as that. Um, my teachers, because of the impact of having to learn a, a completely new exhaustive curriculum, they dropped Open Circle for the first year and the Great Body Shop mm -hmm. for the first year. Um, they added Open Circle back a little bit in their second year, and they did not add the Great Body Shop back. But now it's, they're in their third year. Both of those things have been brought back into the fold. They're finding that now that they are more confident tools teachers, the things that they really loved and were a wonderful part of our curriculum before, they've brought back in and have time for that. So that's where we're going with that. Um, Okay, so um, I think maybe the last thing I want to talk about is the future. Um, Pre-K, Monotony um, is considering tools for their pre-K um, classes, and um, tools is in the process right now of writing a first grade curriculum. So at some point, um, we probably are going to look at that and see if we're interested in that. That's farther on down the road, but that's definitely a possibility of continuing tools into first grade. Um, I want to share with you uh, just a couple more things. One is I, I have one first grade teacher um, who was so impressed uh, about the skills and the behavior of children coming into first grade that she sent an email out after the second week of school um, thanking all of the tools teachers in my building. And I, <clears throat> I made a list from her of the things that she was impressed with. S children way more independent than children she had experienced before. Children who already knew how to work well together. Um, children who, uh, these are called sound charts. And this is um, the foundations, this is tools. Children who could work easily in either one. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually when they're sitting down and writing and the bin on their table is there, um, both of these are in there and children just choose whichever one looks interesting to them. But they're just, it's a, there wasn't any problem with um, the transfer into foundations which is done in, in first grade. Um, <clears throat> she, uh, had a really close connection with the kindergarten teachers and had anticipated the, that things would be different with these first graders coming in. And um, she's continued some of the stuff, which has made her children in her class very comfortable. Um, she does a lot of work around uh, two children working together, one being the checker, one being the doer, and then switching off, which is a very common tools thing. She's continued doing that. Um, she totally has transformed, transformed um, her own teaching. Because in tools, there's a lot less paperwork that children do. There are more things to do, more games. And um, she could see that they were gravitating in that direction. And so she changed her program, which is very much less paperwork. Um, her children occasionally raise their hands. But they were all tools trained. Um, it's, she never said, you don't have to, you should, or whatever. A few kids do, but she's sort of continu continued that um, tradition. Um, and she made all of the tools math games, uh, so that at the beginning of the first, uh, first grade, children would be comfortable. And um, they've continued using them throughout first, first grade, which is great. Um, I think. I think that's it. That's yep. Members, Mr. Hanna? Um, the, the materials that you actually, that the teachers use right. to teach these skills, things like that, does Tools of the Mind provide those? You purchase a kit. Right. Some of them are provided, provided but you, you do still have to make you, a lot. Okay, you indicated that you, weren't the, you and the faculty weren't satisfied with the, uh, the level of the math. Right. So you, you adapted your the, our current math pro, or the, the, um, a math program to go. The previous one. We so as far as the reading materials and stuff like that, 
tonight we heard uh, mm -hmm. some parents concern uh, about books and stuff and mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting to change <laughs> the whole content immediately or stuff like that. my understanding is that one or two of those books is at a higher reading level they're all they're read by the teacher yeah they're read they're the read book. by the teacher these are for units of study yeah it's okay. these are read alouds Thank yes you. they're not intended for the children to be reading although all of us have some children who come into kindergarten who can read them. <clears throat> now, is, uh, uh, the materials that are used, are they just used by the teacher or are they consumable by the students as well that are provided that we pr we're purchasing? Well, there's both types. There's types that you would run off and they're consumable, but there are others that, that aren't. Let me be more specific. Is yeah. this going to be an annual cost that we have to uh, provide to support the program? Oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. Okay. But I have to say that... Um, Tools revises it, its curriculum all the time. And so the kits and the manual this year is an improvement on the last one. And my teachers really begged the teachers who are already learned to get the new, the new stuff. So I've done that. But yeah. No, it's not like yeah, massive amounts of money. Um, I know that there is this movement for teachers kindergarten through eighth grade to read to students at times, particularly above their reading level, and that mm -hmm. has been shown to actually help students become better readers. Um, in terms of the content of those chapter books that's read, is there a broad selection that teachers can choose from, or are there specific materials that align to the program that um, we're somewhat locked into unless we do what we did with math? and yeah, I personally don't have a problem with the books. I kind of like um, me. These are very. Uh, I'm sad for any child that is um, anxious about it. It's the first that I've heard about that. Um, it didn't come up during the pilot, but um, you know, I think these are very provocative topics, um, and children. For example, uh, mummies. Five-year-olds don't really know what a mummy is. These books are not describing in depth what a mummy is. Um, and, but they know this, this is like really cool that we're learning about this kind of you know, uh, um, provocative topic. Um, it's not what they really center on in the classrooms that I've seen. It's more the pyramids um, and, and some other stuff. But in any case, what could happen down the road is that we never use these books after four years, and we decide on another complete series that meets the need, does what we want it to do, um, as long as we do it in a tools way. We're learning with this curriculum the stuff that was produced. Um, but I brought this with me because I'm in classes that are, these teachers, it's their third year. I see stuff all the time that they're doing. It has nothing to do with tools, but they're doing it in a tools way. I walked in the other day, saw this amazing lesson in one class using this book. Now, I knew it wasn't a tools book, so I said, is that? <laughs> she said, no, no, no. But I love it. I always used it. Um, there's this fabulous stuff that we do with it, and, but I just do it in a tools way. I guess... Um my follow-up question to that would be, for any of our students, um, children more than ever before, we're seeing different anxieties. Mm -hmm. um, children, part of the reason the school adjustment counselors at the elementary level are so needed, um, and based on students' individual histories, there often are areas that can create uncomfortable memories and such. Mm -hmm. um, what? What strategies are in place so when there are topics that might be approached in a topical way, um, just as a reading opportunity for the classroom, that parents do get to know and if there is um, some determination that for that child that topic might be problematic, what alternatives might exist within the context of the tools type of classroom? Well, anything that would make a child anxious as a classroom teacher, you would you would not push that. You, you would find another way around it. Um, I know that um, in the mummy book particularly, my teachers um, didn't like the last line and thought that might, the, the last line in the book and thought it might be scary to kids. They just never read it. They just left out parts that they thought were not quite where they wanted to go. And, 
And so what I'm hearing then perhaps is based on the fact that we have had a couple of years to pilot this mm -hmm. and the knowledge that the teachers have of the Arlington students and there, there might be some need to look more closely at which choices are the most appropriate for our population here. Right, but I have to say that, you know, we piloted the, uh, the, all of this stuff for two years. I, I hadn't heard that before. Dr. Allison, okay. um, I'm sort of duplicating yeah. what uh, Ms. Hyam said, but I actually had a child who would have fallen into the same category as the one that we've heard of. We could never read the, the uh, Magic Treehouse books, even through second grade. They were just too scary and too intense. I, I'm not saying every child was like that. It's mm -hmm. just I know there are some kids who are because I had one. I'm and, not and, arguing that there oh, aren't some children. Right, yeah. and, and so my question was, don't, I mean, they're supposed to be, the, the tools curriculum is supposed to be looking at the whole child. Doesn't it come with suggestions for what if the kids are scared by the books? I'm not aware that it does. No, it, but it, it doesn't. But if we had a child like that, read it. can it's, you pass it down? Based, it is it. totally based on those books. Okay. It so the is thing is, if we had a child in a class that was very upset about what it says. this series, we'd find another series that we could use, one for Egypt, one for this topic, one for that, that w would be not anxiety provoking for that child. Just like you would do about any part of your curriculum. You don't want to upset a child in your class. Right, and, and I can understand the appeal of the Magic Treehouse books. It's, right. it's easy, it's got really in, interesting topics to many children. I'm just, I mm -hmm. understand where the concerns yeah. about anxiety are coming from. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask about Jack and Annie. Going. But uh, what I, so I want to I just want to kind of summarize from my uh, my just to, to summarize where I think we're at. A, a, a challenge has been the fun, the foundations yeah. program that's now going to be offered in January. Is that correct? Well, it has been. It has been. Yeah. So it's yeah. now in the curriculum for. No, 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 no. no. It, we offer um, foundation support to struggling kindergartners um, either through the TA in the class or a reading teacher, if a reading teacher um, has some free slots. We have done that in the past because it's easy to identify the children that are really not progressing. Um, and I don't think the tools people like that we do that, but they're certainly aware. So if, there's a, if you identify a need to use foundations, a teacher can use it? Yes. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> the, and the math, your, we're, we're using math that we've used in the past to supplement the math that's offered in, in no, tools. No, no. The, the math in the past is the backbone of the math program. All the tools games are the support around that. Okay. Because it's the same topics that you're okay. covering. Uh, and, and, and I would presume that if there's a, if there's a, if there's a you know, a, a, someone's uncomfortable using a certain tech, Part of a text, or all are part of a text. They have a, they have the chance to consult with their principal about this and talk it through and make a modification or talk so, through. So a, modification. a principal called me um, about um, wondering about something that was written in one of these books, and I said to her, you know, as a teacher, one of the greatest things is you have a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. and it is your responsibility not to read something or do something that you know. Um, a child is going to be upset about. Just, I mean, have you ever read a book to a young child and known, oh, I'm going to leave that line out, that line out, that line out? Oh, every, every day. That's what you do. <laughs> that's my day. That's, that's, what my a, that's what a teacher is trusted to do. <clears throat> or I say in Spanish sometimes. <laughs> So okay, so I guess the, the uh, we're, we're in November, so we're in the we're in month three of the school year. Yeah. So we're in the middle of the second quarter, I guess, right? Is that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for, so we're early in this, yep. and I think it, it seems to me we need to. My, my sense of things is we need to monitor this some more. We need mm -hmm. to kind of keep having discussions. Maybe the, maybe our, one of our committees needs to meet and go in depth on this. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to really have a good sense of whether or not this is. Uh, how successful this is for all kids for another, at least at the end of the year, maybe. Well, we have a pretty good sense, or we wouldn't have gone with the program. Right, we have a good sense in the pilot, yeah. right? I got it, I got it, I got so it. So the other thing I wanted to say is that I do want you to know it hasn't been totally smooth. Mm -hmm. um, there, any, 
any curriculum that just completely pushes the, the curriculum aside th that you were using, that you were doing, that you were creating, that's a huge change. A huge, that's Darn. huge. Mm -hmm. And I, if I had been asked to do that after teaching kindergarten for 15 years, I would have said, see you later. I'm going someplace else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's hard. Um, the amount of work is really, really hard. Um, to get it going, set up, make some materials. And is there, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming, I'm asking, is, is there a lot of dialogue between all of the teachers who are using this curriculum? Are they meeting? Are they getting a chance to meet across mm -hmm. the seven schools? At least? And they also have a rep, every school has a kindergarten rep on the K steering committee. So I, those pe people come to the meetings really with a lot of questions, information about what people are feeling, what they want, what they can do. And the final point I want to make is I don't, I, I, I don't think there's any action the school committee can take at this time other than just keep getting information. You voted it in. Why? Yeah, so it's, so yeah. I just, want to, just wanted to point that out. Yes. So I think that that's my understanding. We can get information. We should get information. Right. We should digest it and, and take it into account. And if you have any questions that, you, you know, that come up over the next few months, you can always email me. Jerry, you said that all the three schools, all seven teachers were really happy with the pilot, but we have 22 kindergarten teachers. My question has to do with, can you hear me all right? Yeah, my glasses are kind of 22, cloudy. we have 22 teachers in the district. Yeah. All right, we had seven who were happy. I'm concerned, and I was concerned in February, and I was concerned this spring about district and teacher buy-in. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about those that may not be satisfied teaching this in their classrooms? Well, I think there's a few people who absolutely don't want to do this, and it probably affects them deeply um, and affects their kind of diving into it. Um, I think that, I think that, that other people, the majority of other people, are buying in to different degrees. I think principals are working very, very supportively with their teachers to try to help them um, do the best that they can do. And there are some people who absolutely love it, that were very concerned in the beginning. And I'm struggling to still understand the reason behind the change. I mean, you, you started the presentation with the background and the accreditation process and the grant money. Um, but to change overhaul entirely um, a student's first entree into the public education system um, seems to warrant a larger reason and attitude adjustment or curriculum adjustment than we were tired of doing the accreditation every five years. Mm -hmm. okay? I don't think that's a reason enough to change. I don't think that's a reason enough to change overhaul entirely, something that's been working for years. And the kindergarten students who were going into first grade were doing first grade well. And it wasn't like they were having trouble adjusting to first grade. So I, I need a better rationale. And I want to put this on the future agendas, at least while I'm still chair, mm -hmm. to keep monitoring it this year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to need some, some better rationale about why we switched to begin with. I can give you another okay. that was a discussion point. Um, and in kind of general terms, um, it was a, the kindergarten program that we had before was a very strong academic program. But the feeling among some is that it was not developmentally appropriate. And that children were being pushed really, really hard um, to learn to read. And, and, and math. And I have nothing against pushing children to learn these things and, and be good at them. Um, I just, I thought, and so did some other people, not everybody, um, but I thought that there's many ways to do this and that the way we were doing it was not developmentally right on target. So that was also part of the discussion. A few other questions before we have to leave this topic for tonight. Dr. Um, Allison Ampton. I actually just wanted to speak to your point about the seven teachers who were happy. I believe the number seven came from the number who did the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, right. It wasn't 
Yes. Only seven among That's 22 I mean, who yeah. are happy. Right. But the other ones didn't pilot it. Right. That's so they couldn't be happy with it because they didn't pilot it. And my question <coughs> had to do with, well, they couldn't be happy and they couldn't be unhappy. They just didn't know. Or they didn't, you know. So, okay. so there wasn't enough Maybe I miss out rollout in the pilot to introduce it amongst the district. We just introduced it to two schools and a control group in another school. Three, Three schools and a control group. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out 10 years ago, which was a different superintendent and very much a different school, that kindergarten curriculum, we actually had um, a disproportionately high number of students retained at the kindergarten level compared to other communities in the Commonwealth. Um, which you know was part of my personal <laughs> journey to this position, which is why the data sticks out. But you know there were there were a lot of children that were experiencing success, and there were a lot of children in Arlington that were not at the kindergarten and first grade level. And so you know, in light of child development and the fact that we were having that issue, and there is a growing population that need executive function services, and this seems directly tied to it. Um, you know, I, I personally think it was an appropriate shift, and I would hope that if there are broader discussions, that it really is not just down to what, whether we liked this better or the previous one, but really is based on educationally what's appropriate for children in our changing world. Mr. Thill? The one point I want to make, you know, 10 or 11 years ago when I joined the school committee, um, and I don't want to criticize anybody in leadership, but the the, uh, the tendency, we would, you would see different programs at, in reading, you would see different programs in math at different elementary schools. So it was not uncommon to see seven different schools operating in seven different ways. And so I applaud the district for choosing one curriculum and implementing it and trying to make it work at seven elementary schools. That's not an easy thing. 22 teachers, 22 different, they're very talented people. You go into teaching, you're talented, you're artistic, you're creative, you've got a lot of gifts, and it's t tough to manage. Uh, I know that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I certainly would never want to see us compromise here or go back to the old days where everybody did their own thing in every school, and every school had their own thing going on, and you know, you would kind of, you know, when, you, when I ran for school committee first, I would hear, well, the Pierce does it this way, and mm -hmm. Thompson under Mike McCabe does it this way, and you know, the Brackett does it this way, and it was, it was chaotic. So I think I applaud the district um, for saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do in all seven elementary schools, and uh, I think we just have to keep monitoring it, and we can't, we can't compromise. We can't kind of do this compromise where somebody gets, the people get to do their own thing in each mm -hmm. school. We can't go back to that. That was a bad system mm -hmm. that, hurt, that hurt kids. And Lieber refers to the, the exact uh, circumstances that led us to make some changes as a school committee years later. Mm -hmm. okay. And just a few others. Ms. Starks? Uh, yeah. So I also want to applaud the district because, um, as I said previously when we were talking to the elementary principals, one of the issues I've had is, um, as a teacher uh, myself, is the lack of play and the lack mm -hmm of really letting students use their imaginations and then just taking that and allowing it. And the thing that I love about this curriculum is that what it does is it takes that and then it talks about the science in that and the you know, math in that and, and you know, just takes a, wonder, it takes a story and kind of then pulls learning out of a story, which to me then shows that kids you can learn from anything and that and I what I really love is how important play is and how important it is that kids get to come up with so much of what happens in this curriculum and I think that that's so vital these days I mean given everything else and how rigorous everything else gets to be as you <laughs> climb up the ladder um, you know we see ourselves with a lot of curriculums that we don't have choice on and so I love it when something comes along and we get to choose it and we get to you know make it our own and I think that the nice thing is is that the longer we have it and the better we get at understanding what it means it's like common core right I mean the new curriculum is rigorous, and yes, as a math teacher, it's really hard for me to be moving to that, but I see the wonderfulness that it can be when I truly learn and can apply and get my students to be thinking and problem solving in the way that, that it will 
make me. And I think that it's the same with this, and that eventually what we see is that we will learn as teachers that, oh, you know, we can do this with any story or with mm -hmm. any, you know, thing, is what we're doing is we're taking a story and pulling out all of the things that we can build on for kids. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it allows play and school to kind of become one and become together. Mm -hmm. And I really like that about the curriculum. So I, I really, I, I applaud the work. I know it's hard. I know it's really hard when we're going to a new curriculum. I hope that we are, you know, listening. I know that those 22 people all probably have great feedback. And so what we need to do is kind of, um, as my colleagues have said, monitor it, you know, make sure that we're meeting and that those people are talking and sharing the great things and helping each other over the bumps with the pieces that are difficult or maybe don't feel right or don't work or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, I think, I think it's really great. And, and I'm, I'm excited personally. I, I was, uh, I, when I was touring, uh, some of the schools last year, um, when we were doing the series, um, we were in a kindergarten class that had had the tools of the mind and just, the stuff that was all over the walls, all the stuff the kid had, the kids had created, you know, the, the, they, they build all this stuff, you know, to put on these plays and they get to decide what to do. And I, it was, I mean, there were no kids in there, but I could just see from all the stuff that it was, it was fun to be there. It was like, man, I want to go back to kindergarten, you know? <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I'm really for it. I, and I, I know it's hard work and I applaud all the work that they're doing. And, and I look forward to hearing what, some of the pros and cons and how we can move forward and, and you know, work those through and, and massage it out and make it something great. So thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to echo my colleagues' comments. I, I have certainly made no uh, judgments based on um, anecdote or evidence, or I certainly haven't poured through that manual yet, and I'm sure there are others like it. But I really, really would appreciate um, regular updates. I'd love to see curriculum instruction uh, take this as an agenda item uh, during this year um, and really uh, sort of uh, flesh this out a little bit. Um, I just had a couple questions on the steering committee, which you call the tool steering committee. I mean, how often does it meet? Once a month. With whom? Me and a representative from each school and a preschool re representative. Okay. And since we're lucky to have the other elementary school principals here tonight, um, do, do any of you have a comment on this discussion? It's new for all of you and your schools, um, except the pilots. But any thoughts, comments, things that Sherry didn't left? Well, there is one big thing that I left out, mm -hmm. which is the writing that children do in the mm -hmm. tools program. Mm -hmm. We had previously, previously been using Lucy Calkins' curriculum, which I love. Mm -hmm. Tools is better. The writing is amazing that these children can do. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. All right. Well, we will continue to. Oh, Mr. Schlicken. I'm yeah. Sorry. One, one other thing is is that uh, with the discussion of what what has been happening in terms of the need for additional behavioral support, social workers trying to get kids to acculturate within a classroom. Uh, the thing that that hit my ear when we first talked about tools last year, and in what I'm seeing now is that this is a means for doing that work and setting up the support structures and, and uh, behavior and socializing children into school in a way that they can come to school every day with a curious um, spirit. Mm -hmm. And if that packaging and that uh, acculturation is is emerging and moving up into the, into first grade and second grade next year. Uh, that is a something that we need to document and demonstrate as being an outcome. Uh, I'm all for uh, once teachers are uh, familiar with the, the program for them within the spirit of it to get off of the fidelity of a first year use and to uh, adjust the, the materials, and maybe there is a need for adjusting materials. Uh, I don't know. Uh, beyond what we're doing, because. Oh, it probably uh, is. But, um, uh, and I'm not going to micromanage to that point, but I, I think that if we can demonstrate the long term outcomes in terms of uh, better educational attainment, kids being on task, able and ready to learn, and interested in, in, in school. 
that, that's, that's, a, that's a good outcome in my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen the long-term effects, uh, mm -hmm. although tools people are looking at it mm -hmm. um, yet, but I have to say this is my seventh year in mm -hmm. Arlington? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sixth year in Arlington, seventh year. You came in when I, around 07, 06, 07. Yeah, yeah. so um, I had three kindergarten classes uh, this year. Um, one teacher is new to tools, but the other two, um, this is their third year. I do not have a behavior problem in kindergarten this year, and it's the first year. Mm -hmm. Do I have a different type of child? No, I have all the kinds of mix that I've always had. Mm -hmm. But they are all very, very, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yep. much, Sherry. Yep. And thank you to all our principals for spending some time with us tonight. Really appreciate that. Your help and your guidance will inform our budget making process. Um, Thanks. We'll be talking again, I'm sure. Dr. <laughs> Bodhi, I didn't let you in on that. Do you, do you have anything to add before they, before they uh, go home? <coughs> I want to thank them all. They're all <laughs> tired after a long day. And they're, they're, they're at school at you know, 7 in the morning. So uh, thank them all. Uh, we will talk more about this as we go forward. Um, and I will echo the last thing that Sherry had said. It, it, uh, well, two last things is, is that she has commented on that this year mm -hmm. a couple times to me, that the behavior, mm -hmm. there are no behavior problems. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah, I want to steal this thing, you know. Maybe that, that's the way to get rid of needing the behavioral yeah. specialists. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that's mm. down, yeah, well, down I the mean, road, yes. I mean, at some yes. point, you know, yes. you can. At some point, right, they can learn. If you were in schools, there'd be no behavioral problems. <laughs> what? AC is the cure. No, I don't think so. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. on. To, uh, but monthly report. financial reporting. <coughs> Ms. Johnson, um, thank you for presenting us with this. Um, um, you were at Long Range Planning this morning. I'm sorry, oh, Mr. Pierce. Um, I just wanted to share with the committee that Dr. Allison Ampey and I didn't get to look through the book as much. And when we asked um, Principal Donovan about getting to hold on to it, she told us that it was needed for a class tomorrow. But we did actually request if she could send the committee the book list for the program. Mm -hmm. And then um, if there are approved alternatives, when one of the book topics is not appropriate for that class, what those alternatives are, um, that that might be helpful in terms of us understanding this issue a little better. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Johnson. Um, you have the um, monthly tracking reports. Um, we are doing well so far. Um, you, we mentioned last month the projected overage and out-of-district tuition. We're still tracking at about the same number at this point. It is still early in the year. We haven't really gone into the heating, heating season, and um, it won't be till the other side of that, and how many snow days or non-snow days will have some budgetary impact that can't be known at this time. Mm -hmm. We do have some... Um, we have had some open positions um, in maintenance, custodial, and um, clerical, some of which are in the process of being filled, some of which have been filled, but because we're almost at the midway point of the year and those salaries weren't being utilized at the beginning part of the year, that's why there is some savings in those lines right now. Any questions, Mr. Hainer? Let me. Line 811, eight and a three. Custodian eight, salary wages. Three ones, eight one 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 three. Right. Custodial, yes. Okay. The August had a positive variance of eight thousand plus. October had a zero variance. Now November has a positive variance of ten thousand. Because we had people in positions who left, and then you know that this is this is a very fluid thing with the comings and goings, and we have added. We've recently hired two custodians, and um, there is more flux in the offing. It, it was it was yes. ten thousand dollars. Early early projections are okay. just that they're projections, and <laughs> yeah, I can't nail it every month. Okay. Thank you. Uh, eight one 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 nine. The summer program. We went from October to a negative variance from four thousand to a negative seventeen thousand. Yes, We're because I round I rounded up the last of the expenses, uh -huh. and moved them into that line. Okay. Now the eight one. 
201 had no variance for two prior, and now we have a positive variance of 66,000. Yes. At the beginning of the year, I'm going to tell you that we're exactly on budget. And as, as things begin to unfold and I get some actual expenses to look at, I feel a little bit more comfortable projecting any kind of variance. But I am really reluctant to, to, to have a variance in the first month. Of the, you know, it's effectively the first month of the school year. Okay, but 02, 03, and 02, 02 and 03 are showing a 98,000 and a 22,000 negative yeah, it, is still, it is still very early in the year, and the way I project these is I take what we've done, divide it by the number of weeks we've done it, and then project it forward. But it could be that they're front-loaded for various reasons. There's a lot of variance this time of the year. I understand that. It's just that the two prior reports had a zero variance, and that's why I'm bringing it. I'm happy with your answer. Uh, again, I will assume it's a similar answer with the uh, 204 and 304, um, I'm sorry, not two, uh, 204 is a long-term sub, it's a uh, positive variance of 45,000. But it's Still, very, again, it's very seven. early okay. in the year. Okay, and uh, 81, 304 maintenance salary uh, went from 108,000 positive variance to 48,000. Yes, to we've added two and a half staff. positions. Okay. Um, Eight we didn't add positions. I, sh I, I misspoke. We filled, filled positions. positions. Thank you. 81307. It says permit. What is it? Um, permit has to do with a particular classification of extra pay that's allotted to custodians by contract for certain kinds of duties. And at the top of my, there's like three or four different pay categories in that nature. And I can't remember which one of them permit is. Thank but it is a special pay <coughs> category under the custodial contract. Okay, and 81314, custodian, custodial clothing. There's a problem with the way it was budgeted that the, cl the clothing allowance for both custodians, m ma or all three maintenance, and the bus drivers was all lumped into clothing allowance. And so what's happened this month is I've broken the budget out that should have been in custodial clothing allowance away from clothing allowance. So the budget was all in clothing allowance. But, but the expenses for custodial clothing allowance had been on a separate line. And so now I've moved the budget to be with the custodial clothing allowance. So basically we, you had three kinds of clothing allowance lumped together, and now I've broken it out into two. Okay, and it was an increase because your original budget was 9600 Now it's 10400 okay. Yes. Okay, I, okay. I just want to make that. Um, teacher moving. That was dramatic. It went from 6000 55 negative last report to 17,000. 17, Who moved in the last month? No one moved in the last month. The expenses have been the same all along. The only difference, if you'll go back and look at those reports, is that I was projecting to move those into a revolving account, and now I'm projecting to leave them in the general fund, but the expenses haven't changed. Okay. It's the projections that have changed. 82404 uh, had all three. Uh, uh, tracking reports have zero in the budget and is now showing with it's still with, showing zero in the budget right there's no budget correct but, right. I didn't have a line item for budget for roof repairs this year okay because and it for, hasn't been a steady it hasn't been a steady expense category in the last three years okay we also a similar thing with ground supply uh, ground supplies correct but we're now showing a negative variance of ten thousand uh, dollars are we incurring expenses one of, the, one of the things that's tricky about maintenance is that when I inherited the maintenance budget, it was all pretty much in one big lump. And over time, I've been trying to break it out line by line. At this time of the year, I'm not going to say that we're going to have savings in HVAC or boilers or anything like that until we get through the heating season. So I'm in sort of a bad spot right now. For the things that have no budget line, I'm showing a variance over budget because there is no budget and I do have expenses. I fully anticipate that there are many lines in the, fa in the facility's budget where I will have savings to offset these. But at this point in the year, I don't want to show savings because that feels unlucky. And my last one, 83802, environmental services. Then it, it only went up $20 from August to uh, October, but it's gone up close to uh, about 8,000 plus since then in a negative variance. 83802, environmental yes, services. Yes, I mean, the budget hasn't changed.
right. the expenses have gone up, and instead of me estimating that, instead of me projecting that I would move those expenses into revolving, I'm now estimating that I'm going to keep them okay. in the general fund. Thank you. Mr. Phelan. Could you just explain the variance formula one more time? I missed that. The, your formula for that column that says variance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> basically, I'm saying at this point in the year, for the most part, that we're going to spend to budget unless I have specific reason to believe otherwise. In the case of some of the salary ish lines, and by ish I mean substitutes, yep. temporary salaries, I am doing a projection based on time. The number of weeks where this particular job would have been expensing divided by total expenses and projected out to the end of the so year. So the variance is a projection for the remainder Correct. of the year. That's what I want to clarify. It's yes. not a year to date. Mm -hmm. We're behind or ahead year to date. Okay, got it. So the bottom line is that the variance is showing us to be slightly ahead of budget by correct and I am continuing to estimate okay. very conservatively okay. so I suspect there are other lines where we're going to come in under but at this point I don't want to okay. I don't want to overcommit that, that's all I wanted to clarify the the yeah. you know the every time in the budget you Diane you've been telling every time in these presentations you keep telling us the special education but it's going to be over by seven hundred thousand dollars and we better we got to get prepared for next year so um, I get, it's not a, this is not a discussion tonight about the FY15 budget. I'm aware of that. <clears throat> but I just mm -hmm. want to leave it out there that it's a big, that's a big number you're showing us. It's not a small number. 700,000 is not a, mm -hmm. it's a big number. That is a big number. And, oh. and I'm very grateful that over the last several years we've had the, the political support to create the reserves that we now have so that, that I'm not staying up every night worrying about that variance. For this year. For this year. Yeah. But, you know, the, the most important thing you can buy yourself in budgeting is time. Right. You know, you have time to adapt to almost anything if you have time. Mm -hmm. It's when you don't have time. And that's where the, the reserves are so vital because special education is something that swings and can swing dramatically and very quickly. Yeah. And so those reserves, that buffering is essential to sensible budget planning year over year. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Um, I just wanted to know on the salary lines, the oh, 81201, 81304 examples, where you're projecting a positive variance, does that mean that you do not plan to fill those positions? No, those aren't positions. Those are temporary salaries. And so I'm projecting those as a run rate based on what's been spent so far over time, and then I'm extending time to the end of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So, so if they spend as they have begun, that is where they would end up. But I have no reason to necessarily know that they will spend at that rate. I will continue to use that mathematical model as we move forward in time. And as the number of weeks that we have actual expenses grows and the number of weeks that I'm guessing shrinks, the number will get closer and closer to where we'll eventually land. So I can't look at these and say, oh, it looks like there's a position that's not filled. No, you, where you would look is in the permanent salaries. Um, Custo you know, and where I'm showing it is custodial salaries, clerical salary and wages, and maintenance, and maintenance salaries, which is 81304. All the other, I, I'm not sure when I built the chart of accounts, it was kind of in a rush, why this number is an outlier, but the other ones, the 81111 through 81117 are all full-time permanent positions. And if I had been thinking better, the full-time maintenance positions would live at, be living at 81118, where they belong numerically. Um, so those are, those are really the categories where it's position by position and where we have a vacancy that you would be showing up those kinds of savings. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just, just for my own, as the year goes on, those variances, pluses and minuses will get... Well, they get bigger, you know, because at this point, well... Oh, well, okay. I will be showing places where I genuinely believe we have savings. There are places where I think we have a really good chance of having savings, but I'm not going to I'm not going to cook my goose by saying so at this point. Thank you. But I am going to say, you know, obviously, if, if I didn't plan a budget in this line and I have expenses, that's obviously if over we'll, budget. If we see a 98,000 positive in May, that looks good. In May. In May. But not in June. May, in May in May. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Ms. Johnson. Um, on to the superintendent's report. Well, I have a, a few things this evening. First of all, um, I want to um, publicly thank and acknowledge uh, all of our social workers in our district. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, we acknowledged this tragedy that we had this week, and it, it literally happened 
a block away from one of our elementary <laughs> schools, and our our children in those in that school left school that day, um, hearing helicopters, seeing police cars, mm -hmm. media trucks. So, um, we one of the things that we have benefited from, and it really showed up um, in this particular crisis, is that we have now this counseling grant, and this summer through the children's room, all of our social workers were trained on uh, crisis care. And what do you do in a, in a crisis to support um, the students, the teachers in, in a building? And so they, they all gathered together, um, were there to support the teachers at Pierce and to support the children at Pierce uh, the day after. And they handled it very professionally, they were just quite wonderful. So uh, I want to say that, and I think that in general, this has been the, my experience since being in Arlington, is that when things happen, people in this district really do come together and support each other in very significant ways, and th that did happen. But uh, it's important that I say that because, you know, we are really starting to see, in a very tangible way, seeing some of the benefits um, of this counseling grant, not to mention all the other good things and in fact uh, one of the things that we probably will put on the agenda sometime mid-year is an update on all of the activities that that are going on through that grant um, I also want to um, congratulate kudos to the high school I don't know how many of you were able to see dead man walking but it was excellent and um, you, well, you, you saw as a committee four minutes of it last week, but the whole play was, was very professionally done. The staging was excellent, and um, mm -hmm. um, everyone was quite spellbound by it. So congratulations to them. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, two of our teachers, and this, you know, occasionally we, th this will happen, but uh, particularly in this situation, one, one of the things I think you've, you've heard is that we have teachers acting as leaders in many ways. They offer professional development, they mentor, they go out and they represent Arlington at conferences, they give professional development on much larger stages and are, are, are acknowledged for their, their knowledge and their leadership. And last week we had two of our teachers who are the um, technology leaders in their building. As I mentioned earlier, we have each school has a technology leader, and um, at, at Thompson we have Nicole Melnick and um, at Stratton, Anne Marie Abbott. And they, there was an, uh, an iPad summit last week in which a thousand people attended the conference, and they were presenters at that conference on the way they use social media in their classrooms. Um, Twitter, blogs, YouTube, uh, Pinterest, which I don't even know quite what that is but they were they had over 60 people there and uh, they had rave reviews um, so I want to acknowledge them because it's a lot of work to present at a major conference and in addition to all of the other work that they do but along the same lines um, I wanted to um, to talk a little bit about uh, that conference in relationship to the, the direction we're going with technology. Um, the, uh, Justin Reich, who is an Arlington resident and founder of EdTech, which is a, um, an organization that does a lot of promoting of technology education, in fact, they were a sponsor of the conference, um, spoke about the necessity when you, when you roll out technology or have a technology plan, about having an educational vision. You just don't get technology just to have more devices and tools and, and it's, it really has to be aligned with a vision. And um, much to our assistant superintendent's surprise, he called out Arlington at this conference as having a vision. And let me just um, <laughs> say this, that, um, that in, um, Meeting with our assistant superintendent in my hometown of Arlington regarding their vision. In Arlington, in grades K to 5, they focus on tools of the mind and habits of the mind. In grades 6 to 10, they focus on the ability for students to conduct discourse and base that discourse on evidence. Everything they do, including how they use technology, 
is there to meet that vision. And that is what is necessary for success. So we may not have all of the laptops, tools, and so forth, but I will say that we're doing, how we're moving forward um, is in alignment with a vision about how you use technology and not just to have technology. So I thought you'd like to know that piece of it. One of the um, other things is that every once in a while we talk about some of the successes that we, our students have in lots of different areas, including athletics. And um, this, this season, we had a very successful season in athletics in many respects. And, and, and I think sort of at the top of it, separate in part from the achievement of, of the different teams, I think that the, the cultural change at the high school has been very positive in looking at um, Re, uh, reaffirming what a, the role athletics plays in a high school in terms of developing a lot of a, a lot of great um, character building skills discipline habits of mind team building collaboration all those wonderful things that they talk about at booster dinners but it's true and um, our new athletic director has brought our captains together um, every Tuesday morning to work with them. But separate and apart from all of those things, they did very well. Um, the uh, football team this year won the Middlesex League Liberty Championship, and they went into postseason, but this was the first time that we've been in the, well, this is the second year, I guess, the Middlesex League, so they did very, very well. Um, our cheerleading group, qualified for regionals at the meet that we hosted a few weeks ago. And so they're going to, they're, I don't know what happened with their competition, and, and, and uh, I think it's actually coming up this Sunday. Um, field hockey team made the tournament for the first time in four years. And um, in fact, in the first round, they, um, they beat the number one seed and, uh, and were able to go a little further into the, into the tourney. Um, girls soccer came in second in the league and made it to the D2 North semifinal game, but they they lost to one of our, um, to, lost to Wilmington. Um, and then the boys cross country competed in the divisional meet last Saturday, and as a team, the boys placed 10th out of 25 teams in the divisional. So that, that's still quite, quite an accomplishment. And... Um, and then Andrew Peterson, who's a sophomore, will be returning to the States this weekend for the second year in a row. So the teams did very well on, in, in all aspects of it, and so we're very proud of our, our athletes and um, look forward to the next season. So those are the, our chair has disappeared. <laughs> That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll do the consent agenda. All items, <coughs> excuse me, listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. <coughs> no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event that item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 14067 dated November 14th, 2013, total warrant amount $636,227.31. Approval of draft minutes, none. Approval of facing racism, Student Weekend Retreat, March 14, 2014, 6 p.m., Sunday, March 16, 2014. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I will return the gavel. Okay. All right. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Policies and procedures. Mr. Thielman. So I move uh, approval. It's second reading of policy BEDH, public participation at school committee meetings. This, uh, the, this basically clarifies um, and tightens some of the rules, makes them a little bit clearer. We talked about this last week, and I present it to you for second reading, and I move approval. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Seven, zero. One, just quick policies and procedures. So. We received them, so last week the committee voted to have the law firm uh, take a look at all of our policies. So Karen, I just want to make sure 
that once this, that all, we make sure everything's updated on the website because she's going to start going through it after. She's going to do it on the website? She's going to go by not taking out a book? No, she's going to go through the website, yeah. So she's going to start after, is that, is that okay? Yeah, so she's going to go through the website and start after Thanksgiving. Mr. Hannah? I, Karen, we are updated on the website? No. Okay. Thank you. And once this is up there, then I think and so she'll start that. She's revising policy KE, that whole conversation we had. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, once we get through the Thanksgiving break, we'll look at dates for a second, another meeting. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, a good number of us were at the uh, long range planning meeting this morning. Um, and I thought it was a great discussion uh, about uh, the school committee budget. I am optimistic. It sounds like they are moving in the direction of helping us figure out how to increase our budget. Didn't seem mm -hmm. to be a discussion about whether or not we needed to increase mm -hmm. our budget given uh, pressures from enrollment, et mm -hmm. cetera. Um, one thing that came to mind, of course, after I left was that um, one of the things I think that we also need to be saying is that although they can only obviously add money to future budgets, that we are living right now in, as we've heard from our principals, in schools that have taken the brunt of this, this thousand additional students that we have in the schools um, since, uh, you know, we started the, uh, the current budget process, shall we say, so with the percentages that we get now, um, and that we need to probably remind them that some amount of some amount of that addition needs to go to alleviate some of the pain that we're already feeling and that we haven't had any relief from so um, I know that those talks are ongoing and I wanted to ask my colleagues because I uh, apologize that I had to leave before the end of the meeting but I didn't know what the outcome was as far as uh, next meeting and what next steps we're taking. So I didn't know if we scheduled a follow-up meeting. And oh, okay. I'm digging it up. It's sometime December in December. 16th. December sixteenth. That's correct. It's a Tuesday. Uh, no, that's Tuesday not, it's morning. It's a Monday. Monday. Monday at eight a.m. Oh, excellent! I can December sixteenth. Monday eight a.m. Okay, and uh, is that when I know that they had re requested that you run some. Scenario it's numbers. actually going to be Adam and Andrew that are that are pumping various scenarios through okay. the long range plans, the um, various iterations on a per pupil times the number of new students, and also an iteration based on a um, a 1.8 percent increase on the non fixed part of our budget. I'm not exactly sure who they're going to ask what the fixed and the unfixed part of the budget are. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that calculation is going to go. So I have Andrew. I know. Or I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Flanagan, the deputy town manager who does a lot of the number crunching, is away at professional development the rest of this week. But I suspect when he comes back next week, that he will be talking. Okay. All right. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, so I guess that's. So for everybody, that's kind of where the whole budget talking is going, because I know that that's a major part of where we stand right now. I feel like we're kind of in limbo. I mean, we will continue to move forward in hearing from the principals and starting to have those kinds of thought processes. But um, obviously, we're kind of hoping that more money will come instead of could you speak a little bit to the Stratton discussion we also had this morning? And um, I, I didn't stay oh, much oh, beyond uh, that, so I had I had to leave. So, so yeah, we we spoke about the Stratton, and you know, there I think it was reaffirmed that there's a very strong commitment to moving the Stratton forward to parity, um, but that with the understanding that the MSBA will probably not look that favorably on a major reconstruction project, so that this is going to have to be. A multi-step process, part of which is going to be to determine what parity is, but in the determining of what parity is for the Stratton, we have to bear in mind the ability of the town to finance it without support from the MSBA. And so, so it has to be, so that what's in play now is the development of a, a building, I mean, for want of a better term, a building committee to, to determine, um, with many stakeholders, to determine what parity would be, what it would look like at the Stratton. And, you know, so that it is on an e even footing with the other schools in the district that we can that we can afford. And there was some discussion about methods to finance the Stratton, with the idea being 
that we would try to do it without the need for a debt exclusion, that we would still do what needs to be done to bring the Stratton to parity. Um, there was some discussion of, of reallocation of assets, um, perhaps some sales to move that forward to create revenues to do that. Um, and that's it. So I don't have a budget subcommittee meeting yet. I'm kind of hoping that some of this will <laughs> we'll have some money to talk about. So. All right. Community relations. Nothing. Curriculum instruction assessment accountability. I speak of your name earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, we will be meeting before we will schedule a meeting before our next uh, session. And would you consider taking up the tools in the mind? I'd like to talk to the administration about what things we, I mean, how we would go about taking that. I mean, what what would be the result or what would we, what would happen mm -hmm. with that? Okay. So. Facilities, Nothing at this time, but I would ask the superintendent just to reaffirm we're going forward with the SOI on the high school. Yes, we are, Mr. Hainer. So we've reached the end of our regular meeting. Oh, uh, secretary's report. Secretary's report. Oh, my goodness. It's all right. Uh, it's very few. Uh, it's only been a week, so, you know, we didn't have much. Um, but we did receive the following correspondence. Um, emails from Linda Hansen, the president of AEA, about concerns with Boston and releasing teacher ratings to the public and what that means in Arlington and requesting a discussion about what school-level release of data will mean in Arlington and how we want to deal with that. So it's something that another subcommittee might want to um, start thinking about. Uh, we did receive email from the superintendent outlining how the tragedy in town was handled in the Pierce School, uh, as well an invitation for a wellness summit to be held at Gillette Stadium on Tuesday, December 10th. And that is it. Thank you. Now you've come to the end. I did, well, I did want to put uh, Mr. Hainer on the spot. Oh, excellent. You want to meet him this, but I, I thought it would be best if, uh, if he spoke about it. Oh. If you didn't mind. Uh, the children's room. Please bear with me to uh, to read it. Uh, today is uh, uh, Children's Grief Awareness Day. This day was created to help us all become more aware of the needs of grieving children and of the benefits they obtain through the support of others. Uh, I volunteer at the children's room. I uh, it's a it's an honor. I've been doing it for six years. I thought I was going to do it for six months. Uh, it has helped me deal with the grief that I had when my mother passed away or with almost 30 years ago. And it's a wonderful thing and it's an understanding. And I would uh, recommend those of you in the audience and here that don't know of the children's room, you just go on the website, take a look at them. They're a wonderful organization. And I would like to commend the superintendent and the children's room for the proactive way this system is. I taught in a system for 28 years that would only react to tragedies. And we have wonderful programs and wonderful people here in this. Uh, and it's with the support of the administration that makes this go forward. Thank you. And on that note, I really would like to thank the students who came earlier tonight mm -hmm. and what they uh, showed us about what they were committing to this year in terms of uh, generous, uh, just the generosity in town, parents and students exhibit. Um, we're going to be doing more of that uh, as the meetings go on this year. We're going to see some more examples of our students' work. and. Um, it's really nice. So, um, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to move into executive session and conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non union. If it should held in an open meeting, it has to be <coughs> And to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on bargaining or litigation, litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Memorandum of Agreement, Arlington Education Association, and AEA, evaluation changes for the 2013 2014 school year, performing in visual arts and arts and reading, exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. No, no, no. Oh, we'll no, no. no. So we'll exit for that. Uh, second. Okay, roll call. Aye. 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 Yeah. <laughs>
We're back in regular session. We're Yay. adjourned ex executive session, and we have a motion to, uh, to make. Yes, Mr. Hanna? I move that the school committee approve the memorandum of agreement between the Arlington Education Association Unit A and the school committee regarding evaluation changes for the 2013-2014 school year performing and visual arts and artisan reading. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Aye. That passes. And uh, Mr. Fielman, another motion? So I move that the uh, Arlington School Committee will participate in an interest-based bargaining process with the Arlington Education Association in the upcoming negotiations, and some of our members will undergo a joint training with the AEA in the coming months. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.